Hello, everyone. Welcome to Rose in Science event. I'm Wang Hui from CELM, the Changchun Institute of Optics, Biomechanics, and Physics, Chinese Academy of Sciences. Thank you very much for taking part in the 2022 Rose in Science event on the International Women's Day. Rose in Science was initially launched by CELM in 2015 to mark the UN International Year of Light. With the roles in science, we aim to shorten the distance between people and achieve heart-to-heart -heart communication. Our goal is to help those young women who dreaming of having a career in scientific research find their own life coordinates and show them what is possible if they persevere. This year, we have invited 12 female professionals from six continents in different age groups and different working fields to talk about their work and life and share their insights with us. In the first session, six speakers have introduced the latest developments from the fields of mathematics, optics, academic journals, and shared their personal experiences. In this session, we will also have six speakers who will show the latest progress and the future development in industry display technology, and the micro nano devices and the systems. Our first speaker is Professor Achana Bo Laksma from the University of Mauritius. Let's watch a video first. The lady playing with the cute puppy in the video is Dr. Achana Bo Laksma. She is from the Republic of Mauritius, an island country in Eastern Africa. Surrounded by coral reefs, it has two UNESCO World Heritage Sites, and is known as Switzerland of Africa. Dr. Baloximon is a professor of biomaterials engineering and nanomedicine and head of the Center for Biomedical and Biomaterials Research, University of Mauritius. She is a polymer chemist by training and works in the area of biomaterials engineering and nanomedicine. The center focuses on research and development in the area of nanotechnology. It has performed pioneering work in this area in the Indian Ocean region, particularly engineering nano scaffolds to regenerate human tissue. It develops intelligent materials such as self-heating polymers. The research group is a multidisciplinary team bringing together chemistry, biology, predictive modeling, physics, and engineering expertise. Three quarters of its members are women scientists. Dr. Balak Simon received the UNESCO Mark Best African Woman Researcher Award in 2017. She was selected by the New York Academy of Sciences as future leader to the 11th Science and Technology and Society Forum in Japan in 2014. She was named Outstanding Young Scientist at the first Commonwealth Science Conference held by the Royal Society UK in Bangalore, India in 2014. She won the Commonwealth Science Award for established scientists from the Royal Society in 2017. She was visiting professor at the Zhejiang SciTech University in China from 2018 to 2021. So now let's welcome Professor Bao Laksma on the stage. The title of her talk is Harnessing the Potential of Biomaterials Through Resourceful Chemistry for Bell Medical and Satellite Applications. Please share your screen with us. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me. And I'm going to try to take you for our journey from polymer chemistry to uh, biomaterials, to using these biomaterials into uh, uh, applied engineering. Now, let me first give to you a brief overview of what we do at the center. Uh, the CBBR is the Center of Biomedical and Biomaterials Research. I like to say that this is a spin-off center of the University of Mauritius. And here we uh, build our intellectual capital by training PhDs and postdocs. We have our research and innovation for us. And we also provide our services to industry to help them in process development and uptake of uh, nanotech. This is, in general, what we do at the center. Now, chemistry. Chemistry, uh, I like to say that it is a central science. And it is a central science because it connects the physical sciences with the applied sciences. And chemistry, we should not forget, it is the building block of 
matter and life. Therefore, how to harness this uh, chemistry into having applications that can be translated for the well being of the society. Now, let me take you through our story. First, we were polymer chemists and 10 years ago, working in our area and doing polymer chemistry reactions, making polymers, making monomers. And then uh, we started uh, looking at how we can apply, translate this polymer chemistry knowledge to other applications. This is when uh, Professor Jerry, he was, he's the first polymer chemist on the island, and he set up the Center for Biomedical and Biomaterials Research. And we needed a hypothesis for the research work that we were doing. And our hypothesis was mainly organized around natural biomaterials could mimic biopolymers in human tissue and thus influence cell behavior. Now, this was our hypothesis. And we also hypothesized that one material cannot fit all. That is why we started looking at materials engineering. Therefore, using biomaterials, we uh, stepped in materials engineering, and then we could look at the different applications. We started with wound healing, then we moved to 3D tumor application, and then to nanofiltration membrane. Now, how does our hypothesis, how do we bring our hypothesis to life? We have to observe nature's building blocks, its environment, that is the extracellular matrix. Because if you want to influence the cells and thus influence tissue regeneration, you have to understand the environment of these cells. And you have to be able to mimic them on a micro and nano scale. Now, this ECM, uh, there are two key factors that we have to look at uh, for the extracellular matrix before we can mimic them. Uh, before we can make the cell believe that this is the natural environment, we have to take into consideration that the ECM does not migrate, does not contain DNA, and does not proliferate. And another important observation is that prior to metastasis, the cells, the tumor cell, they lose all contact with the ECM so that they can move and go to a different part of the body. And another observation that we made is that the biopolymers in the tissue, they form networks. And you have two examples here. You have uh, an example of a fibronectin network, and then you have an example of a collagen network that you have in the human, uh, in human explants. Therefore, we have to be able to harness these observations and translate them. Now, the biomaterials, as you've seen, Mauritius is an island. And being an island, we have got an exclusive economic zone of 2.3 million kilometers square, which is quite big. And we should be able to use the materials from our marine resources. And there are a number of materials that we have used. We have used materials from seaweeds, all types of seaweeds, but we also have used uh, biomaterials, which are not necessarily polymeric materials that could enhance the quality of tissue regeneration. Then we also have our land resources. These are some of the materials that we have been using. Uh, the, in, in our history, Mauritius, we used to be a, a French colony first and then a British colony until our independence. And the island used to have the sugarcane industry as a major industry for the economy. And it was time to valorize this sugarcane plant and look at high value added products. This is how we could use uh, um, biomaterials from the sugarcane plant. And then there were others that we have been uh, studying and using. Now, once you have the biomaterials, understanding the chemistry is very important to be able to do biomaterials blending. Now, once you understand the chemistry, then you can come up with different types of architecture in tissue regeneration scaffolds so that you have that micro and nanoscale present in your tissue regeneration scaffold. Now, the scaffold, what, what is it? It is a support for the cells to grow on and produce new tissue. It's just like when you're making a building, you need a scaffold to uh, uh, make your building. 
And we have been working on different types of architectures from nanofibers to hydrogels to cryogels to hybrids and to new architectures where we have the uh, micro and nanoscale at the same time in the same structure. Again, trying to mimic the extracellular matrix. Now, once you can do all this, what is the next step? Don't forget that we are polymer chemists and we have no experience in doing in vitro or in vivo experiments. Therefore, you have to build that expertise. And we, we needed to build a team, a team that have people with basic science in particular areas and add-ons. Add-ons, I mean, having chemistry with the biology uh, knowledge, having uh, biology with the chemistry knowledge, all these are extremely important because the nanotechnology field is highly interdisciplinary. And this is the team that we have been building for the past 10 years to allow us to now bring our scaffold to some applications. Therefore, translating, therefore we have the biomaterials chemistry, the architecture engineering, now we need to step in in vitro and then in vivo. Now, the in vitro, we set up our own uh, bio lab, uh, train people, we have a, a fully functioning bio lab, which is the only one uh, in a public institution uh, on the island. And then we build up a pool of innovation for health in the Indian Ocean region with our sister island, La Réunion. La Réunion is a French outer territory. They have the unique EU approved animal facility in the Indian Ocean region. And we build up that research platform and we could get into in vivo translation. We could train our own lab members into doing preclinical trials. And these uh, uh, in vivo preclinical trials, we started them in 2019. And uh, we have completed a screening all the scaffolds for a number of applications. We have been looking at wounds, including diabetic wounds, at bone wounds, and uh, recently at cancer regenerative medicine. And then using all our data, we have been trying to use AI for predictive modeling. That is, we want to be able to predict the uh, scaffold performance and to know which factor is really uh, affecting the cell material interaction. And lately we have built up a consortium. This is just uh, last year, late last year, with uh, Mauritius, La Réunion, Ghana, Kenya, and Germany on the Leshmacu project. It is just phase one of the project, bringing people together. We, we, we are looking into uh, scaffolds that could address the Leishmaniasis wound, which is a disease of developing countries and a very complicated a wound due to bacterial infections. And with diabetic and wounds in general, what do we want the scaffolds to achieve? Because there are a number of scaffolds that have been reported. We wanted scarless and accelerated healing. This was our aim. And while so doing, we also wanted to have affordable uh, medicine for the uh, continent, for the African continent, because uh, scaffolds are quite expensive, those that have reached the clinical setting. And we wanted to choose our biomaterials and our engineering techniques in such a way that we could easily later upscale these processes. Now, for scarless and accelerated healing using the scaffold, we need to be able to understand the different stages of the wound healing. That is, particularly, we've been focusing on the inflammation stage and the proliferation stage. The inflammation stage is very important in wound healing because it's going to determine the fate of the wound because uh, uh, the phenotype of the cells involved in the inflammation is going to determine whether it's going to progress from inflammation to proliferation. And uh, uh, next, now we started testing all sorts of other cells because we have these two stages that we want to study. And then 
we know that there are not only macrophages and fibroblasts that are involved. We need to look at all the other cells that are around them. We have the cells forming the blood vessels. We have the, uh, if we are looking at bone regeneration, we need to look at the osteoblasts. Therefore, using chemistry and engineering, we have been able to impact the cell material interaction. Uh, I said at the beginning, one material does not fit all. Therefore, by using material blending, we could adapt the scaffold according to the cell's requirement. And these are just pictures of the different cells that we have grown. We have not only done monoculture in vitro, we have done uh, more than one cell, two cell types, three cell types culture, so that we really could observe what is happening in vitro. Now, in diabetic wounds, there is also one type of scaffold that we have looked at, the are piezoelectric uh, nanofiber scaffolds. Now, why piezoelectric? Remember, I said we wanted scarless wound regeneration. Now, when there's a scar formation, it's basically the fibroblasts that are involved in that type of uh, uh, wound healing. That is, you have scarring that occurs. That is, they will adopt a morphology that will cause scarring to occur. And we want to impact on that. And this is what we try with the piezoelectric scaffold. We, uh, the movement of the uh, animal motor that we have used could generate electricity and then impact the morphology of the fibroblasts so that at the end, we could end up having a no scar formation in uh, this series of tests that we have done uh, using uh, piezoelectric scaffolds. Then, as you know, diabetic wounds, they are not homogeneous wounds and they can be deep wounds. This is where our hydrogen scaffolds uh, could be uh, uh, tailored for this type of wounds. And here, it's not only scarless that we were looking at, but the quality of the tissue, because usually diabetic wounds, they can heal, but they can open up. If when, when the patient has, uh, is working or standing too long on their feet or sitting too long, these wounds, they open up. Why is it so? It's because the mechanical property of the tissue which is regenerated is not good enough. Therefore, with the hydrogen scaffolds, we wanted to address two types of things, not only the scarless, but also having good quality tissue and uh, we could uh, show uh, using different types of controls and comparing with our injectable hydrogel, because if the, the wound is heterogeneous, having an injectable hydrogel, which can also self heal itself it, if it is broken, it gave to us good quality uh, type tissue. Then we continued in our scaffold engineering. Remember I said we have to mimic the biopolymers in the human tissue, they are basically polysaccharides and proteins. We looked at silk-based uh, scaffolds, and then these scaffolds, they are, uh, we look at the behavior of the cells, and then we could see that, uh, for example, here, we could observe ruffling of the macrophages, ruffling, they need this to move. And if you look very carefully, you will find these types of structures all around our macrophages. Therefore, it's very important to pay attention to details. And for the bone regeneration, I'm going to rapidly take you through these results. They are just uh, last year's results. You will see that with the injectable hydrogen X doesn't only work on the skin, but it is also working, shows good promises on bone regeneration. And uh, in terms of now, using the scaffold for other things, we have been doing, uh, applying them in in vitro tumor models, putting different cells uh, in the tumor microenvironment together and trying to see what they give and then later test drugs which are loaded in the scaffolds. Therefore, the scaffolds could be placed after a tumor resection. It will allow the good cells to grow, but it will prevent the tumor cells from coming back. And we also load small molecules. Uh, at the beginning, I said it's not only the polymeric materials from the sea, but it's also other biomaterials from the sea that we use. Right now, we have a, a family of molecules that we have identified from the Indian Ocean region, and they are being screened for cancer and then loaded into uh, a scaffolds and testing. We are just screening them for cancer, and we are benefiting from the help from our collaborators in South Africa 
uh, the VITS advanced drug delivery platform for that. And lastly, how do we use this data uh, to predict? We want to predict now. We don't want to do like five years ago, we had to do all the blending, all the scaffold, you have 150 scaffolds, and then you start testing them. Now we want to be able to predict. If we do some blending, what would be the outcome? And then we go on testing them. We have uh, done a first uh, study, which has been published, where we showed that fiber diameter is indeed an important key parameter. Now we are looking at the inflammation responses. That is, can we predict the, the morphology of these macrophages? We are working on that. And all this, uh, we, uh, when the COVID-19 hit us as well, uh, we put our expertise together with industry and came up with a nanofiber filtration membrane with very high efficacy. And we all use our nanotech mask in the lab because we still have to wear masks. And this mask has got a very high uh, um, viral filtration efficiency, has been certified in Europe and in the US as well. Uh, and to end, I would like to say that the challenge for, since we are talking about the International Women's Day, the challenge for women scientists is, uh, you know, there's always refraction to change. And uh, we should not be scared of change. It's, it's normal that, for example, for us, when we step from polymer chemistry to biomaterials to in vivo, in vitro, these were all changes for us. We had to learn. And sometimes uh, it's quite challenging but uh, the results are very satisfactory. And then we need to unite our expertise to be able to address these challenges. And the way forward, I will say that a strong opposition is sometimes, it's, it's sometimes good. You need to harness that strong opposition and transform them to innovative ideas. And since we are uh, on the International Women's Day, I cannot uh, not mention uh, the women that the, the woman, in fact, that has been contributing a lot to uh, uh, helping me be where I, I am on a personal uh, note, it's my mother. And I would like to pay a tribute to her today. And this is the group and 70% of women in the group. And we've got our industry collaborators, medical doctors. It's a whole group working without a group it's almost impossible to achieve anything. You may have good ideas, but you need people that can do the work. You have to valorize that. And a take home message, if we have young scientists listening to us, we should always keep our curious minds. We should cross boundaries and we should do chemistry that matters. And then we can transform our, our secondary school students, for example, to Marvel superheroes. And we usually like to have them in the lab. And uh, because of COVID pandemic, we have not been able to have any open days, but we just love having them in the lab. With this, I thank you for your attention and thank you for listening to me. So a big thank you to Professor Bao Laxman. It's really amazing to see the applications of bio materials, and I hope it can help our life more easier. And now let's invite our next speaker, Professor Deepa Vakitash from the India Institute of Technology, Madras. So a video first. What comes to your mind when you think of India? Bright colored, beautiful saris? Delicious and rich food? Or the countless beautiful heritage sites? In recent years, a series of Indian films have been introduced to China and won the hearts of large numbers of young people here. As a result, many young Chinese are beginning to focus their attention on India, a country that is perhaps more similar to China than different as they both boast long history, rich culture, and now strong emerging economy and large expanding market. Today's guest at the Rose in Science event is from the beautiful ancient land of India. She has been committed to promoting the status and influence of women in the scientific research community for many years. 
She is a journal editor, a scientist, a teacher, and also does outreach activities. She is Professor Deepa Vankitesh. Deepa Vankitesh is a professor of the Department of Electrical Engineering in the India Institute of Technology, Madras. She was born in Mumbai, but spent most of her student years in Tiruvannamalai, the capital city of the southern state Kerala. As a scientist, she set up the high-speed optical communication laboratory in IIT Madras, where the focus is on demonstrating photonic signal processing for high-speed analog and digital communication systems. As a teacher, she has guided students at the postdoctoral, doctoral, masters, and undergraduate level, and was awarded the Young Faculty Recognition Award of IIT Madras in 2011. She is an associate editor with the Optical Journal, Advances in Optics and Photonics. Also, she is the associate vice president of Women in Photonics of the IEEE Photonics Society. Deepa is also responsible for initiating the Reignite Back to Career program, which enables and supports women who have had a break in career to come back to mainstream academia research workforce. Okay, now let's welcome Professor Vankitesh on the stage. And the topic of her presentation is a light brightens life. Please share your screen with us. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from whichever part of the world you are joining. Uh, my name is Deepa Venkatesh. I work in the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, in the Department of Electrical Engineering. Uh, first of all, let me thank the organizers for thinking about me uh, to and to invite me uh, for this event and patiently working with me last few weeks. Uh, for the material for the conference or for this event and testing the event and so on, it's really been a great pleasure uh, working with you. Uh, let's move on to the uh, talk, especially because today is um, the International Women's Day. Uh, I'll first tell you uh, where I come from. Uh, this is, of course, the uh, submarine map of. Uh, Uh, the world where these brightly lit lines that you see are optical fibers that connect us, right? And that is how we are able to connect together. Of course, uh, I am coming from uh, India uh, in a city by name uh, Chennai, used to be called as Madras before, which is here in this corner. Are you able to see my pointer? Yes, yes, I can. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. So, <clears throat> this city is on the coast, facing the Bay of Bengal, and uh, within the city, uh, our institute is located inside a forest. So, what you see is the boundary of our institute, IIT Madras. Here is a highway that would lead you to the airport, and and inside the forest. Uh, In addition to these uh, beautiful flora and fauna, uh, we have 16 departments, 25 research centers, about 10,000 students, about 600 faculty members, and we have very proud to be the uh, Indian ranking first for the last six years. And we do work with a lot of foreign universities for our uh, joint degree programs and also in postdoctoral research programs. Uh, as i said because it's a women's day i would just try to give you a background uh, to say that i uh, did not really have a very linear career my career has been extremely non linear after finishing my masters bachelors and masters in physics which is in the southern state of tiruvananthapuram i moved to pursue my phd but there was a break in, in uh, i tried to do my phd in iit delhi but there was a break i came to mumbai where i was working as a scientist in uh, in the tata institute of fundamental research lab which is samir in mumbai and later on again i was uh, going here and there and then i ended up 
uh, going outside India, came back to India and as a lecturer in the Mumbai University. I did my PhD from IIT Bombay and ever since I've moved to Chennai and I'm working as a faculty member for the last uh, 13 years in IIT Bombay. Uh, what are my research interests? I work in the area of nonlinear uh, optics. I'm basically uh, trained in physics, but I use nonlinear optics for engineering applications, which is why I am in the Department of Electrical Engineering. Uh, what do I use this for? I could, I, our lab builds fiber lasers. These are lasers which could be used for medical applications. It is also used for the gravitational wave interferometer applications. We are trying to build lasers which <clears throat> which finds several such applications of different specifications. And the laser power from the laser we can use to uh, demonstrate nonlinear effects. What do we do with these nonlinear effects? We could do, you could use these nonlinear effects in optical fibers for distributed sensing. You could, uh, sitting at this point, you can really see what, you can sense what is happening 100 kilometers away, for instance. You could do acoustic sensing. <clears throat> you could also use nonlinear optics to our advantage by doing what is called as optical signal processing or photonic signal processing, which is a slightly advanced version of electronic signal processing, where the processing speeds can be, <clears throat> can be at as high speed as the speed of light. There are several optical processing functionalities that we do. And to be able to demonstrate this photonic processing, we would need a high speed optical communication test bed. And so we have a high speed, very high speed terabits per second coherent communication test bed in our lab. We also do uh, transport radio signals over fiber. And recently we have started our effort on continuous variable quantum key distribution. Coming to the subject of today's talk, uh, what comes to your mind when I say light? If you close your eyes for a minute and uh, hear the word light, what can you think about? You could be thinking about the nice bright sunshine, you could be thinking about the light that is practically useful, which is a bulb, or you could be thinking about the nice winter lighting in, in, in this is for example, a picture from Japan, or this is a picture from a highway near our home, which is all lit up in the night. This is all what you can, or rather there are many other things that may come to your mind but this is the general picture that you see uh, when I say light. The question I have to you is, uh, does light have any role to play to enable this to happen, the cellular uh, conversations to happen? I'm not talking about the visual video that I'm talking about, but in terms of uh, light's role to enable signals to carry from one cellular phone to the other, do you think light has a role to play? And the answer is, uh, it is light that enables these cellular technology to work. Uh, everyone is familiar with this amazing journey of wireless technology, evolution of mobile uh, communications, where we started with a very old standard, where <clears throat> we started with 30 kilohertz uh, uh, carrier frequencies and you know kilobits per second data rate or old generation cellular phones to the 5G technology where the carriers, your, your information is carried by 2.3 gigahertz to 3.45 gigahertz. This is the frequency range for 4G for instance and 5G is supposed to carry 100 Mbps. Um, this is uh, yet to come uh, a commercial in India, maybe China, it is already there. But over the years, we have seen that the cellular technology has evolved from very low data rate systems to very high data rate systems. The question is, how are these uh, signals carried across the globe? Let's say I'm making a call today, I'm sitting in this uh, event and I'm connecting to a cloud in which is which is a zoom call which whose whose data center may be sitting somewhere in china or in india or i do not know i'm making a call, phone call from here to anna how do i how do how does the connectivity happen the connectivity happens because from my instrument i will connect to my nearest cellular tower which is handled by different service providers and all that is aggregated into a distribution hub 
and beyond that it is all optical fiber which is loaded with all the wireless data so even though in our uh, in front of us we are seeing a, a, a laptop or a, a cellular phone which just we really do not see an optical fiber but behind the scenes all this information is carried by this uh, optical fiber uh, why should i use an optical fiber why can i not connect the world with simply copper the reason is that uh, if you look at this plot which is attenuation attenuation is simply the loss of power loss of power as a function of frequencies remember as we evolved in cellular technology we were moving higher and higher in frequencies and as you keep moving higher in frequencies turns out that a copper cable a coaxial line or even a waveguide they have all very very high attenuation which means you cannot transport your information to very far distances but if you see optical fiber irrespective of your frequency doesn't matter what your frequency is optical fiber is forcing very small attenuation which is only 0.2 db per kilometer and so optical fiber becomes the choice of the medium when we were trying when you are trying to transport very high bandwidth information very large data rates over very long distances uh this is the uh, status today of the submarine link so when i'm trying to talk to you from india from here the nearest from the nearest uh, submarine station i am connecting through submarine stations to reach uh, china and this is how we are so for example if i'm trying to talk to somebody in the us i may be going this way all around africa to reach uh, if it is south america here or if it's north america it could be coming this way and reaching north america this is how the connectivity happens and all this is happening just within the time that you are dialing a number and reaching your friend in the us and all this is enabled with optical fibers uh, just to give a primer on optical fibers for those of you who are not familiar it, it's a glass strand and it is as thin as human hair our hair is as thick as an optical fiber but within this optical fiber which is made of glass you have something called as a core and a cladding and it is just multiple reflections that is allowing the light to pass through so in this particular beam of light you load your information in this beam of light and that information is carried through the optical fiber how did this information carrying uh, idea happen i mean the fact that an optical fiber uh, could carry information was from the simple experiment which every stem outreach program may be showing you can use uh, this is a water pipe and this experiment was first done in 1840s by colladen where he showed that he proved in a public demonstration that light can be guided it can be bent even though light travels in straight line it can be bent whenever you have a higher refractive index when you are able to push light through a material of higher refractive index and this is what an optical fiber is of course it is not a stream of water but you try to make glass of higher refractive index and you allow light to guide through it uh historically for the first time an optical fiber was made by an indian whose name is narendra singh kapani this is the photograph this is the device that he made of course it was not useful for optical communication but it was useful as endoscopes so these are bent pipes which could be inserted through the mouth so that the doctors can see what is inside your uh, your uh, uh, food pipe and so help the doctors diagnose diseases uh, inside your gastrointestinal tract and this endoscope uh, was first made by this uh, group of people from uh, uh, the, uh, even though he's an indian he worked with uh professor hopkins in uh, london and this endoscope idea of endoscope uh, was first done by that group and hence we we would we take great pride in referring to uh, dr narendra singh kapani as the father of fiber optics of course as i said this was not useful for communication and the first communication grade fiber was made by um, charlie cow and his group in corning glass and that won the nobel prize in 
and they made a fiber which was lo whose loss was uh, four decibels per uh, kilometer. Uh, soon after, in 1979, the best optical fiber was already made by NTT and group in Japan, where they achieved a loss of 0.2 decibel per kilometer, and this began the era of fiber optic communication. Even today, the best single mode fibers that can be made, the best optical fiber that can be made for communication grade has been at attenuation of 0.17 decibels per kilometer. This is how the uh, starting from Narendra Kapoor Singh Company's uh, invention to now, this is the landscape of optical communication. So I'm sitting in my home here, which is connected through an optical fiber through a hub, which goes, find it, finds its way through a metro network, which could be from Chennai to Delhi to you know, uh, metro cities in India, which could also go through other bigger metro networks. Uh, to reach China, it may be going through a submarine network, reaching the uh, metro network of China, and then coming back to the metro network of Changun, and then reaching the homes of the place uh, that you are seeing. We are also accessing Zoom, which could be whose who's, uh, memory and storage could be in a data center network. And the guess what? The connection between the data centers is also carried out by fiber. Uh, optical fibers are also useful to connect your antennas to base stations because the amount of information carried by cellular phones are really high, which requires optical fiber. So even though you are not seeing them, optical fiber communication is omnipresent. How is light able to carry this information? What are we doing to carry this information? So here is an example of how light gets modulated with information. So it's all digital data, which means all the data that we want to transport are converted to zeros and ones. And this red wave is the light wave, which gets whose amplitude can get modulated according to whether your information is zero or one. You could also choose to uh, modulate a pair of bits as one symbol so that you get some slightly different kinds of modulation. This, of course, is going to be much faster because in one slot, you're transmitting two bits. You could also do phase modulation. You can change the phase of the electromagnetic wave to carry the information. You could use, instead of using a phase of zero or pi, you could use multiple phases. This is 45 degree, uh, 135 degree, uh, 215 degree and minus 45 degree as the face to represent bits. You could use different colors to carry information. So this wave need not be of a particular color. You could use different carrier colors. This is called wavelength division multiplexing. You could also use polarization, different polarizations to transport information. So you can use colors and this represents, this curve wiggle represents the data. You could Modulate the data in both orthogonal polarizations. These are possible polarization states of light, possible directions of electric field of light, and you can combine all of them and transport. So majority of my work is to do this modulation and do the correct detection and do a demodulation, digital signal processing to recover the data uh, get back to the constellations, the, the constell these are the constellation points we call, get back the constellations that we transported. So here is an example of an experimental test bed where we generate the data. This is all, uh, in that sense, a uh, uh, simulated data generator. This can generate very high speed data, can do the modulation. You can emulate really long lengths of fiber by using a noise loading. So we don't have really long length of fiber, but we emulate that by putting a lot of noise in the system. Here is the receiver, and then you have an analog to digital converter. Here is where uh, I showed you in the earlier slide a picture of two constellations. Here is where uh, each dot actually represents four bits of information. This is called 16 quadrature amplitude modulation. So we do all the data processing, a lot of signal processing, uh, engineering work happening to generate this data. So here is the example of how we generated one terabit per second. One terabit is one into 10 power 12 times 10 power 12 bits in one second. 
We could transport that through an 80 kilometer of fiber by doing some tricks in different modulation, by doing some tricks in detection and doing a lot of tricks in digital signal processing. So we transported these 16 data points from this end through of 80 kilometer fiber and we received the same uh, data. Question is, you are talking about one terabit per second, but at home, we are talking about internet speed of 100 megabits per second, at least in India. So do you really need this capacity? And the answer is yes, because the success of 5G and 6G depends on this high capacity. So here is where your small cell or macro cell gets connected to a front hall network. This is a wireless network. From there, there is a baseband pool which controls how and when the signal has to be transmitted, received, etc. And then it goes on to the metro network, uh, submarine network that I showed you earlier. So it turns out that even here to connect from the baseband to the cellular phone, you need optical fibers. Now, the next question is, okay, I, have, I understand that uh, large capacity is necessary and you need optical fibers and you demonstrated one terabits per second, but what actually limits the capacity? Why not 100 terabits per second? Why not 1000 terabits per second? So the capacity actually is limited by a very fundamental uh, limit, uh, which was put forth by uh, Shannon in uh, 1947 or 48. And it turns out that how much data can I transport depends on what is the signal to noise ratio? How strong is my signal with respect to the noise? Right? That is your signal to noise ratio. So it turns out that as your signal to noise ratio increases, so larger is the signal to noise ratio, more strong is your signal, the capacity goes on uh, increasing. And the, the part that is marked in red is not something that is achievable. What is in white is what is achievable. And today from uh, the quadrature for QPSK modulation, I showed results with 16 QAM modulation. You could do 64 constellations, you could do 256 constellation, the capacity goes on increasing. But the problem is if I were to transport this kind of constellation, which is a large data rate, I need to have a large signal to noise ratio. My signal should be very strong when compared to the noise. Now, what is the problem in having that? The problem is that as you transport through long lengths of fiber, the signal power starts falling. Can I put a large power at the beginning of the fiber? I can't because optical fiber is very tiny. It is of the size of the hair. So what happens is if you try to put large amounts of power, you will start seeing nonlinear effects. You will start seeing very strange uh, additional frequencies coming up and that is not going to help. So the Next type of work that we are doing in the lab are one of these, how to reach the Shannon limit and how to solve this problem of capacity for the next generation communication systems. The wireless systems are going to go beyond 5G, 6G. People have started talking about 7G. Now to support that the capacity of optical fibers should go on increasing, but the Shannon limit prevents this capacity scaling so our research is focused on four different basic ideas. How to reach Shannon limit? We see that we have really not reached the limit. There is a, there is a gap here. So how are, what, is the, what is the reason for this gap? And how are we going to reach that? Expand the carrier frequency. You, uh, this is again another different way of expanding the capacity by using what is called as ultra wideband communication. So you use certain colors to transport data. We are trying to see what is preventing us from using more colors, more wavelengths, use a large band of optical uh, frequencies for transport. The third way is to scale the Shannon limit in the sense that can we create more channels in the same optical fiber by using what is called a space division multiplexing or more division multiplexing so that it's like a highway. Instead of having one, one track, can I put 10 tracks in a highway and increase the capacity? That's the third approach. And the fourth approach is photonic processing. This requires a lot of physics in it. And what are we trying to do here? We are trying to um, 
reduce the noise and thus increase the signal to noise ratio so these are the four broad areas that i work on and this is how our labs work has progressed we started in 2016 with uh, <coughs> the installation of my high speed test bed we demonstrated 256 and uh, gigabits per second over in 2017 we went on to 400 gig demonstration in 20 uh, uh, 18 2019 we demonstrated space division multiplexing uh, we also are moving on to terabit per second with what is called as uh, smart pulse shape pulse shaping techniques with super channels with coherent ofdm we moved on to using a uh, 64 qam and trying to reach the shannon limit so these are the broad areas of my research of course there is not much time to discuss the details um, a google scholar search will give you the details of all the research that we do and all this research is possible only because of several students of mine who do all the work to uh, make all the research happen uh we are really proud that the students who have graduated from our uh institute are uh now in literally in different parts of the world and trying to spread knowledge uh thank you very much so thank you professor vankitaj light really brightens our life and i can't imagine what our life would be if there were no light And I'm sure our modern life would be totally different without the fiber, which plays a very important role for us. So our next speaker is Professor Yi Hui Wu from Changchun Institute of Optics, Fine Mechanics and Physics, Chinese Academy of Sciences. First, a video. Though a successful scientist with many impressive titles to her name, Professor Yi Hui Wu prefers to be known as a loving mother, doting grandmother, caring owner of a cute pet dog. And the loved and respected teacher of many students, Professor Wu received her PhD degree in engineering from Xiangpi in 1996. Since 1999, she has been a professor and group leader on micro devices for biomedical applications in Xiang. In 2000, she was invited to the Femto SD laboratory in France, where she worked for one year on acoustic sensors. Currently, her team is working on major instrument special projects. Of the National Natural Science Foundation of China, her research direction includes microfluidic control, biosensing, Raman spectroscopy, gene sequencing, etc. She has published more than 100 papers in SCI journals and has over 30 patents to her name. She is a distinguished professor of Chinese Academy of Sciences, general counselor of Chinese Micro Nano Society. The deputy director of the State Key Lab of Applied Optics between 2002 to 2014, and has been executive director of Chinese Micro Nano Society since 2014. She has won the title of National Female Worker Model of Meritorious Service, and Young Professional and Technical Talents with Outstanding Contributions in Jilin Province. So now let's welcome Professor Wu on the stage. The topic of her talk is from single cell to single molecular. The challenges for optofluidics. Please share your screen with us, Professor Wu.、Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay,、uh, I will share my presentation now. Uh, is this okay? Uh yeah, yeah. Just a moment. It's okay now. Yeah, please. <laughs> oh,、uh, many many thanks for inviting me to this talk, and、uh, I think、uh, my talk is uh, uh, rather uh, how to how to say just now. Uh, Hai Xia said, or、oh, you change the your topic. Yes, it's very it's true. Uh. This time I try a new topic,、uh, which gave the review of、uh, single cell and the single molecule, and、uh, the challenge of、uh, optics and fluidics. And this optical fluidics is the meaning of、uh, not optical fluidics; it's the optics and the fluidics. So, um, I yes, it, this is a very big topic. 
for a single cell and a single molecule. And uh, I didn't do it so for such a long time, so long, but I hope to, to share uh, some thinking and uh, hope to get some uh, doubted by anyone uh, who is listening. So uh, I'm very happy uh, just uh, start. Um, I think uh, oh, people always uh, know we have uh, many, many, uh, maybe 200 cells in, my, in our body and it's a different kinds of uh, cells. But uh, why uh, we have to, it has been uh, divided for uh, so many kinds, types of, but why we have to, to think about the single cell? In fact, uh, uh, the, the cell line uh, nowadays is uh, uh, always developed. It's not in the same uh, level. And uh, because uh, we, for example, these uh, hundreds of uh, cells in the spectral, specific tissues, but uh, some tissues, uh, they still have a sub, subset of the cells and the uh, uh, tumor cell, uh, for example, uh, this uh, drug resistance, uh, we, we talk a lot, but we, we try to understand why uh, some of the cells uh, can be killed by the treatment, but some not. So the uh, mechanisms of uh, microenvironment immune cells has been used a lot with uh, med new medicine, but uh, you still find uh, these same problems and uh, some, some cancer cells uh, still there and uh, you, uh, they cannot be killed. So people are very much uh, wanted to know uh, why. And uh, from, a, uh, from a thing, uh, I think the uh, sequencing technologies nowadays are very much uh, uh, developed uh, from the bark one to the single uh, molecule uh, sequencing technologies. Uh, this become uh, from a very expensive to not so expensive and to a short uh, lunch to long, very long uh, molecular DNA. So uh, with this uh, technique, we might know the mutation of the uh, DNA, our DNA, but uh, most of people we have uh, almost the same DNA, but uh, we are so different. And uh, what's the reason of this? And uh, uh, this DNA sequencing, uh, when, when it developed, it's uh, still left a lot of uh, uh, questions um, we don't know. In fact, uh, almost uh, all the cells in the body share the same DNA, but marks uh, the, the marks are different uh, how the DNA ready to the cell and the RNA present with different between cells at the supper. So uh, with this uh, central uh, dom dogma, DNA to RNA to protein, uh, if we still agree with this uh, central dom dogma, it seems uh, we must know more about, except the DNA we have to know about RNA and how the RNA translate, translated to protein. And the molecular the time uh, revolution of the single molecules at uh, undergo chemical and the biochemical reactions uh, make it possible to characterize the molecular trajectories uh, as a price of obtaining data, not only the, the dynamic data, and now to the, the whole supper. So it's a very uh, guide the drug development uh, very much nowadays. So from uh, molecular to the cell, and uh, it's, it's uh, from a protein to DNA, RNA protein, and the uh, molecular uh, and the cells, the single cell multimations uh, has uh, uh, very much uh, come up today and the, the technique for single cell oscillation, sparkling and the sequencing to method multiple types of the molecules in the same cells and the integrate analysis of the, for example, mRNA 
with uh, DNA, mRNA, DNA, uh, malady, malation, and the mRNA chromatin assemblers. So DNA gene alternations and the gene expression uh, has been very uh, so important to help us to understand uh, ourselves and the, the disease. Uh, and the molecules can work with the cells. Uh, now, uh, immune targeted uh, therapy of uh, treatment of the cells uh, has been developed very much. And uh, uh, from this uh, picture, we can see the about the markers, the biomarkers can show on the surface of the cell or in the in, in cells and the, with the optical marker and the distinguished uh, mark uh, different uh, wavelengths of the the markers and the immunations and can find this marker and the kill this uh, the marker connected the cells and in this way uh, for example this uh, yeah, new article on cell, uh, you can see this picture. The yellow one is uh, this is uh, the uh, related uh, of a antibody uh, has been uh, recognized, and the red one, the antibody missed uh, uh, missed uh, recognized. That 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 means uh, we still have uh, at least twenty three of the metastatic uh, sites are missed by antibody drugs. This is uh, the, maybe this can answer uh, why uh, we have these drugs. It's so useful and uh, uh, by, by one turn, two turns, three turn, and uh, you, you have to change the, the drugs and uh, maybe it works and it, it may be not. So uh, still lots of uh, things and no. The other example is uh, about uh, uh, AML, is a accumulated nikelia. Nikemia, this is a very uh, serious uh, blood cancer, which is uh, died, is uh, uh, very much dangerous nowadays. Before it's for old people, but now uh, trends to be younger. And the uh, chemo chemotherapy is uh, still uh, may treatment, uh, you, you, have, you have to kill almost all the cells on your body, on your blood, and then to find, the, to, to try to kill the one, uh, the cancers. But um, in this uh, blood cancer, blood cancers has many kinds of, and this blood cancer is, more, is the most uh, dangerous one. And uh, this one, what 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 problem? Uh, and uh, it's uh, the one of the is with uh, all the methods of uh, immune therapy and uh, uh, more morphological and uh, phenotype gen genetic genetic and all the methods people try to figure out to, uh, why it's so difficult and uh, some can can be uh, can get uh, a treatment. Uh, a very good uh, results, but some cannot. And the, the people, different people has different, the individuals are so different. So, but we, if we want to understand and to, to go further with this technique, uh, I, for myself is uh, very confused because uh, for the physical physics, uh, you, you might know something and uh, with technology technique, and you use a physical principle and uh, might can use directly in the technique, but uh, for biological is the conclusions, the, the results, uh, it's same change the every day. And uh, before you, you understand and you think it's right, but after just uh, one year or several months, it's uh, totally different. So. The, the other thing is uh, the molecular, the size of the molecule is uh, several nanometers and the cells are about uh, uh, several micrometers. And uh, to measuring this uh, so small uh, size uh, bio uh, materials, signals range interaction uh, quantity.
and the living molecules, not the, the dead one. It's okay? Can you hear me? Yes, no? we can, yeah. Okay, uh, multi-field strong copters, uh, extremely complex multivariate system and a huge amount of data we have to deal with. The thermal, uh, the, the molecule is so small and the thermal activity and uh, uh, is uh, a stochastic nature of the molecular uh, collisions from the thermal path is uh, like uh, just now, uh, lots of speakers said about uh, the noise and the signal. And uh, this is uh, a big problem of uh, the ratio of uh, noise and the signals too. And uh, very much we have to deal with and almost uh, the limitations for all, kind, all the fields. And uh, uh, maybe optics, uh, for optic tweezers, uh, these uh, several years are developed so uh, advanced and the desire to follow the dynamic of the molecular processes in the real time and the behavior of the molecules in the assembler. So they had to make this uh, uh, research on uh, protein to nuclear acid and the nuclear acid to for example, mRNA and uh, uh, ribosome, and uh, it's uh, between the proteins and the nucleus, the FRET detections. So this is uh, maybe uh, can be more sensitive and uh, it's a, a hope of these uh, interactions of uh, uh, molecules. And uh, we, have, uh, we have worked on the micro nano optic fibers uh, event wave sensors for biology for a long time. And recently, recently we have the, the good results uh, for very sensitive uh, for from uh, in the serial uh, clinical detection of uh, uh, CEA, for example, the biomarkers of cancer and its sensitivity sensitivities uh, in the in the real situation of this in serial has been uh, 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 have been reached uh, very, very much uh, um, hope, hopeful for the, the future of uh, POCT clinical applications. And uh, the, for labor-free uh, detections of uh, uh, this kind of uh, interactions of uh, molecules di directly, the non-specific absorption is always a problem in your uh, detection. And uh, the, one of my students uh, who did a uh, lot of uh, experiments for that, and uh, uh, in the uh, last year, and uh, she got these good results for uh, CEA detection. And uh, the other problem is we have to uh, also isolate the different kind of cells, and with very much uh, uh, purity, high purity, and uh, uh, very much high collection rates. This, uh, I think, flow cytomic, cytometer is very much uh, popular now uh, in the hospital and the research. And they marked by the biomarker and the uh, fluorescent and this different kinds of uh, different type of uh, cells distinguished by the biomarker. And they, uh, with a very high throughput and uh, to predict the emergence uh, uh, to, to collections of the cells also. But the problem is it cannot predict the unknown uh, molecules and uh, for example, protein, the biomarker, you can, you, if you don't know it, you cannot, distinct, you cannot use it. So still we have to uh, try to find a way to, to make, to get the uh, unknown molecules and uh, try to do the research. So we isolated this uh, different kinds of cells, especially the cells we are interested in uh, with a very much precision and uh, uh, soft and gentle way and with a high throughput. So microfluidic uh, is come out. Uh, since this, uh, uh, it, can, it has been so many years uh, worked for it, people. And then nowadays, this, this nearly about 10 years is is almost uh, uh, be application uh, applica uh, application in many 
uh, clinic uh, uh, ways. So for example, this uh, deterministic uh, literal displacement dis separation method, uh, we, uh, lots of people uh, have been succeed to separate the, the by size, like uh, big size moleculars and the uh, small size, you can, uh, we have, we, we got the uh, resolution like uh, three micrometers. If the size of the cells can be three micro difference, you can uh, use this way, it's very successful. But uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, the cells size almost, for example, in the blood, uh, many, many kinds of the, uh, cells, they have the same size, even uh, they are cancer or not, or normal. But uh, uh, what, what's the difference, like a uh, physical difference of these uh, cells? Uh, maybe uh, we try uh, ab about the uh, density and uh, stiffness and uh, deformation and all the, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, mechanical and uh, physical uh, differences of the cells. We have to try to distinguish the, this uh, uh, cancer size with uh, even uh, at least the cancer size and normal size. So the size deformation based uh, uh, cell separation with this uh, uh, rate, the flow rate and the pressure uh, we, we did and it seems uh, possible. The other way, uh, with a CD-like chip, and uh, this, this work may have been done with other uh, biochemical reactions, but this for uh, cell uh, sorting is so, uh, it's very much challenged because the sensory uh, transition flow, the local standard flow uh, can, cannot establish at the beginning. And uh, one of my, my students uh, who, uh, get these results, uh, who made this special uh, particle flow in the separation chamber and uh, acting as uh, extrusion flow and the particles are separated in different speeds. And uh, this is, uh, uh, but it's uh, still lots of problems because this, uh, uh, this distinguished by size and uh, densities and, uh, and the throughput of these uh, chips are still uh, not so high, but uh, it, it's uh, very uh, interesting to to fulfill it if this is out. It's very, uh, in fact, some uh, with the particles, uh, it's uh, purity is very high, it can be a 95 percentage. Uh, with uh, with uh, the real cells, uh, like uh, Kenya, it's like uh, uh, with different kinds of, uh, uh, if the size is uh, uh, different uh, enough, it uh, still can be uh, very high, like uh, 99 percentage, but the purity is not so high. And it's a, you, you, can, uh, you can get some uh, a very special one, but the um, still many, many uh, challenges uh, for the small differences of these cells. And uh, to, uh, when you're shooting the size the cells, it's not enough. You have to put these uh, cells, uh, the individual cells in the different places and uh, you, you might want to do the sequencing of the single cell. So this, uh, uh, this capture cells in the droplet is a very uh, successive way and we try this uh, also. Uh, the other problems uh, when uh, when the molecule is small enough as nano, like DNA and RNA, so if you want to deal with a single one, it's uh, only uh, like uh, uh, the the how to say the uh, one one dimension is only uh, nearly nanometer, and the other is very long and very thin. Uh, this kind of uh, material and uh, nanopore is uh, a very developed of more than twenty years, and uh, they have uh, many uh, many ways to use. But still, uh, they face the uh, problems of uh, the precision and the accuracy and the repeat, repeated, repeated 
uh, for the frequency and to try to uh, manage this uh, this kind of a small and uh, nano of chips, you have to uh, people use bark chips and uh, instead of uh, protein chips, but the protein chips are more easy to man manipulate uh, to manufacture. So uh, it's even uh, they are uh, the long, uh, how to say this cannot keep a long time uh, to use and uh, it's still uh, a challenges and the people are very much involved in it. For uh, optics, uh, we, we think about uh, optics. So the first is uh, imaging and, and uh, maybe uh, spectral. Uh, this imaging people uh, talked a lot uh, for the last 20 years, like uh, uh, how to uh, break the uh, diffraction limit. And uh, uh, with this uh, diffraction limit, it's, uh, uh, but I think uh, it's uh, for, for the classical optics, it's, it is there, but for the special uh, manipulate the, uh, the particles and uh, uh, this kind of uh, this solution maybe can, uh, can be uh, not a limitation because the face of the light is in central spot changes a special spatials and the rate larger than uh, normal for the independent phonons. So this is uh, the accuracy solution limit uh, is because of this uh, arbitrary uh, small diameters maybe uh, use uh, is uh, many ways. Uh, people talk about uh, super oscillation and uh, uh, nonlinear abe and other uh, mean theory and the other uh, lots of uh, functions except the, uh, the, the illumination. And uh, this, uh, but now uh, still, uh, I think the most uh, uh, useful and uh, successful way is super resolution uh, microscope is uh, called a resolved uh, concept. This kind of uh, uh, controlling the depletion of the light intensity distribution so that it can be limited numbers of the molecules can be switched on and the uh, majority of the uh, molecules are dark. So in this state, uh, you get the results and a very high resolution. And this is a uh, people all know now. And uh, we try to uh, make this uh, a microsphere uh, and the people in 19, uh, 2011, uh, they got the results of a very high resolution like uh, 50 nanometers of resolution of, uh, from a, a microsphere. And we want to know why it uh, can be because in a, Transmission of the invention wave to propagation uh, in normal situations cannot get these modes. And uh, maybe well, we have discussed about uh, whispering gala modes stimulated and the contribution of a near field invention wave. Uh, maybe it can, it can be the reason and get uh, this uh, high resolution. And uh, one of my students uh, who did the photonic nanojets generated by horizontal grade index microcylinder. And this microcylinder, I think you must be sure this uh, uh, optic uh, refractive index is not so high. If, uh, if we don't uh, confine this uh, uh, index, you, you, you make the index like uh, much higher, much high, so you can get uh, any results uh, like you want. So the resolution can be in and the no limitation. But when the index is uh, uh, limited, uh, like now we often use the, like uh, not, not bigger than two or three and this uh, nano jet uh, are very much limited, but it's confined in this way can be smaller. And this nano jet we can uh, with a microsphere, uh, the normal uh, microsphere in air, alcohol and the P the MS uh, materials, we can see uh, a kind of uh, imaging. Uh, it seems the resolution and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, increased, it's much better. And uh, in the future, I think uh, 
it, it to solve those problem is maybe we have to use a quantum uh, superposition like a, a quantum uh, special state, uh, multiple uh, like known this known state, and this can be it's a reasonable and the measuring of the nearby emitters critical technique uh, and this is uh, has been reached the super resolution. Um, I think it's, uh, but it's very difficult to do. And the quantum uh, statistic, uh, this sub diffraction limit uh, can be uh, less than 10 nanometer and critical uh, high efficient phono connection rate, uh, how we get it. And this is uh, uh, the other super resolution uh, is just like uh, the, the first one's being uh, the soft. This uh, current states uh, has been applied applied in physics resolution less than uh, 10 nanometers. Uh, it gives another hope to make it uh, different. But image is not uh, enough. We have to know the, uh, the difference of the cells, not, not only from the size and the uh, morphine. We, we have to know the inside and what happened and what kind of materials come, uh, the difference of the uh, molecules uh, or structures. So with this uh, Raman uh, spectrum spectroscopes is light and the matter uh, with uh, the molecules, they, they are interaction with in elastic uh, collision and it's exchange and uh, lead to the change of the structure, light uh, wavelength and the frequency difference. And nowadays it's uh, a labor free uh, method to to get the uh, fingerprint uh, spectral uh, spectral uh, it's uh, uh, very much uh, uh, developed and uh, it's uh, uh, there are always uh, has new results and uh, uh, much better than before and the sensitivity uh, by this kind of uh, coherent processes uh, with uh, uh, a source or other other method, it's uh, uh, we are uh, we has uh, almost uh, get the resolution uh, like uh, image resolution and uh, spectral resolution and the cells. Uh, it it uh, used in chemical reactions before, but now it's uh, moved to the bio, and uh, we have to uh, overcome the background of the. Uh, molecules of uh, fluorescent uh, substrate and uh, other uh, Raman signals. So we, we developed a, a method to, to do that. And the 3D um, uh, cluster analysis, and we, we have uh, uh, used it in uh, blood cancer detections and get the original results. And in our group, we have uh, developed the two kinds of uh, uh, spectrometers, uh, Raman is a uh, one is uh, based on the Hadamard transfer uh, spectrometers. Uh, the other is now we are using uh, SIS and uh, may it means uh, a spinter, uh, uh, spontaneous with uh, a coherent, uh, non coherent, and the coherent one, and the one for the uh, very wide wavelengths and the uh, uh, finger uh, print and the other for the very high sensitivity. And maybe we can uh, try with the uh, unable living cell study with a uh, high uh, resolution imaging and uh, high resolution uh, of uh, spatial. Uh, so in these two ways, uh, thanks very much to my group and uh, so many people involved in it. Uh, my colleagues uh, before was my students and some are not. They, uh, doing and guide the students to do a lot of work. And this is a picture I haven't uh, changed. Some people, some students has uh, worked in, they graduated and uh, work in a very good uh, position in uh, China and uh, some still there and some new uh, new person join us. So I will change. And uh, thanks to the collaboration, collaboration with uh, Tsinghua University and especially for Jinning uh, University of uh, Hospital of the University, uh, first one, the second one, and some uh, other foreign uh, companies, uh, foreign uh, universities.
So thanks very much. And uh, uh, from the corporation, uh, this is uh, so important for us and uh, we get uh, uh, to, to understand of the bio uh, much more about this. So thanks, thanks to you for your in attention and uh, uh, listening. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you, Professor Wu. So optics is really amazing. It is a subject to study both big and small. Uh, okay, yeah. our telescope are getting bigger and bigger to see further into space. And our optics so systems are exploring smaller and smaller to control the single yeah. side. <laughs> yes. Even the macro tunnel word, right? <laughs> yes, yes. So yeah, I I, I couldn't uh, speak so uh, fluent English, and uh, uh, involved in this field is not so long. So uh, we have to work hard and <laughs> try to get the new results. <laughs> it's developed so fast of this field. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm. Very good talk. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So our next speaker is Dr. Marie Bardiel, Product Development Manager of the French company, Bioantimatic Fuel Cells. Let's watch the video first. Many people automatically think of basketball as a sport for men. Today, we're smashing that stereotype as we're meeting a beautiful young lady who excels in both basketball and science. On the court, she embraces the freedom and excitement brought by basketball, at work, she is resolute, meticulous, and conscientious, which has gained her the position of product communications manager of a company. She is Dr. Marie Bechtrol. Dr. Marie Bechtrol graduated from the University of Oregon with a Master of Sciences, as well as from the Université Claude Bernard Lyon in France with a Master of Formulation and Industrial Chemistry. She then undertook a PhD program at the Université Kenobol Op in the development of biosensors based on microstructured electrodes and physically microencapsulated biomolecules. In completing her PhD, she has developed a strong knowledge of electrochemistry and zymatic reactions, as well as affinity biosensors by working on a multidisciplinary subject gathering chemistry material sciences and biology. In the last year of her PhD studies, Dr. Bechtrel took part in the creation of the startup Bioenzymatic Fuel Cells, a company created in May 2020 as a spin-off of the French National Center for Scientific Research. Dr. Bechtrel's first job with the company was communications officer. After gaining her PhD, she became a serious scientist working on developing the company's core technology. After a year, she was promoted to product and communications manager. Her role is to be the interface between customers, suppliers, and the R&D team in order to provide smart and sustainable products. Okay, so basketball, boxing. So Dr. Bakdial, you're very good at sports. And uh, okay, so the title of uh, Dr. Bakshila's presentation is uh, Bell Molecular Immobilization for Bell Sensing and the Bell Energy. So, yeah, please. So, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this event. And I also want to thank the organization team and Martin Tio. Um, so, I'm just going to begin. So, I put a little bit of my background, but obviously, we have seen it in the video. So, I'm just going to go very fast. I, I, um, was a part of the co-founding team and um, the creation of the, the startup BFC that stands for Bioantimatic Fuel Cell. Um, and uh, for every day uh, and every goal that I set, I always go by this sentence, dream, hope, chase, believe, reach. Um, so I integrated BFC while I was still a PhD student as a communication officer. Then as a PhD candidate, I was still um, a part of the team. And then when I graduated from my PhD degree, I um, was promoted as senior scientist and communication manager. And then recently I was promoted to product and communication ma manager working at the interface between the R&D team, the suppliers and the clients. So now I'm gonna talk more about bioenergy and biosensing. 
So a biofuel cell is simply a device that helps to generate energy from renewable sources. Um, there are several cases. You can have micro, microbial fuel cell or in our case, enzymatic fuel cell. So we use enzyme to convert abundant biofuel, in our case, glucose and oxygen, uh, into energy. And we play with the redox reaction happening at the enzyme in, and electrode interface to create the, the current. Uh, also during my thesis, my focus was mainly on biosensing and immunosensing. Um, so uh, I'm gonna talk about more about the diagnosis. So the case study I was working on was the dengue fever. Um, so obviously throughout the years, we saw an evolution towards POCT, point of care testing, um, because it's less expensive, it's less complex to, to achieve the, the diagnosis, and it also takes less time. So a lot of improvement have been made on that, um, on that part. And so a biosensor is composed of mainly two elements, a bioreceptor and a transducer, which uh, in contact with the analyte, so by um, metabolic reaction or by affinity, uh, will uh, transmit a signal to the, to, the, to the transducer. So there are several biosensors. There are enzymatic biosensors. Uh, DNA and uh, antibody antigen as well. And the focus of my thesis was mainly on antibody antigens for the dengue virus. They are easy to, to use and low cost. And most of all, um, the, the, the field I was working on was electrochemistry. So electrochemical biosensors are also very interesting for real-time response and allow to have label-free detection. And most importantly, they allow to have portable device, uh, which is very important for point of care testing, particularly in countries where uh, the access to hospitals and um, medical care is not often um, possible. So there are many properties that are interesting and important for biosensing. So first of all, the selectivity, uh, the bioreceptor need to be uh, selective to the, to the analyte. Then the storage lifetime, the reliability and cost, the you know, range, sensitivity, uh, and limit of detection. And um, sorry, the text is misaligned. Shouldn't have been like this. Um, and particularly uh, those three uh, in, in pink, so the sensitivity limit of detection and reliability and cost are the most important and are driving um, the design of such biosensors. So now the what's most important and to um, facilitate those properties and to make sure they are um, they are where they should be, uh, the immobilization of the bioreceptor is the most important step. We need to ensure that the bioreceptor is uh, properly immobilized onto the transducer to transmit the signal upon biorecognition. So there are several ways to do it. There's physical adsorption, reticulation, uh, inclusion in a matrix, or then covalent bonding. And uh, the focus of my thesis was primarily the covalent bonding using uh, polypyrroles, but uh, self-assembled monolayers can also be used. And uh, the particular particularity of polypyrrol NHS was that I had a good living group and I could immobilize um, a lot of um, uh, proteins onto the surface. So this uh, monomer was composed of a pyrrol unit and a good living group pyrrol and hydroxy succinimid, uh, which basically allowed to activate the ester. And the polymerization was done by electrochemistry. So by electrogeneration, uh, we performed oxidation of the monomer unit. Um, and uh, by performing several uh, electrochemistry, electrochemical techniques, we could polymerize um, with a controllable thickness the, the polymer onto, onto the transducer. So there are several ways to do it. Um, there's cyclic voltammetry. 
as you can see here. So basically you can see the oxidation of the monomer around 0.7 volt. Um, then after oxidation, the signal of the polymer, and as we ox oxidate, the polymer grow and grow and grow. This is why you see the, the increase of the signal. Then uh, we can also use chronoamperometry, which allows us to fix a certain potential and then uh, observe the evolution of current as a function of the time. But those two techniques uh, led me to have uh, signals that were not so reproducible. So another technique that I used was uh, chronopotentiometry, which allowed me to have a fixed current and a fixed charge of polymer that I wanted to add. This allowed me to have a um, signal that was more stable and most importantly, more reproducible with a control sickness. And this is um, very important in the construction of a biosensor because you want to make sure, um, first of all, you can that you can immobilize the biosensor, but second of all, that the immobilization layer is quite reproducible from one electrode to the other. As you miniaturize, uh, the device, you face uh, changes, big changes in uh, sensitivity. And uh, this is one of the main key features that you have to, to focus on. Um, in my thesis, I started by uh, making a model with the glucose oxidase, so a simple glucose biosensor. Uh, using this technique and on microstructured electrodes, so I invite you to to, to look at my thesis if you want to see more details. Um, but the goal was basically to add glucose to a, um, a system at three electrodes with agitation under chrono um, and to follow the, the creation of the current by adding more and more glucose. Uh, obviously it's not the glucose that is detected directly it's actually the formation of hydrogen peroxide, which then goes and get oxidated at the electrode. So this is how a chronoamperometry look like. So every time you add glucose, you can sense uh, the, the, the creation of current. And uh, by doing so, you can have access to um, a standard curve that then allows you to have an info on an unknown samples. Uh, and then I moved on to making an immunosensor for the detection of the uh, N uh, NS1 glycoprotein of the Deng virus at different concentration using electrochemical um, impedance spectroscopy. Um, so voila, I'm just gonna go very fast. You can find more information on uh, ResearchGate uh, and on my social media. And uh, now let's talk about uh, BFC and uh, what, what we do. So we make electricity with papers and enzymes. It's an eco-friendly energy solution for low power electronics. We saw that there was this growing trend towards smart and connected devices, particularly for patient monitoring, uh, logistics and connected packaging with an estimated of 50 billion primary uh, sorry, 50 billion connected devices in 2020. And nowadays, low power is ubiquitous. We can power more and more electronic components with less and less power uh, between nanowatts to a few milliwatts. And BFC as a company uh, and as a device, as a sweet spot in that range. But the problem uh, for those low power electronics uh, as of today is that they contain miniature batteries, which are complex, expensive, and unecological to recycle. Hence, they finish in landfill or are incinerated at more than 50 billion per year. And from those 15 billion, 97% are miniature batteries. To address this environmental issue, BFC has created a paper-based biofuel cell it's ultra thin, lightweight, and flexible, as you can see on the picture. Uh, we use enzymes to convert glucose and oxygen, which are abundant biofuel, into energy. We basically take the technology that we have within our body and, uh, and use it on the paper. And it, this is actually uh, what we were doing at the beginning, 
Um, we came from decades of pioneering research on implantable technology from the group of Serge Cosny. Um, and so we pivoted from implantable to portable devices. And this is why the technology is so disruptive. And this is also the reason why we use organic materials um, like cellulose and carbon papers to, to build the device. We also have proven the biodegradability and the compostability of our device, uh, and also the non-phytotoxicity, which means that they don't affect the growth of the plant after degradation, and even before degradation. So BFC um, paper fuel cell are eco-friendly and non-toxic. Uh, they contain no metal and no plastic, and uh, most importantly, they are low cost. In parallel, we also build a flexible uh, PCB, printed circuit board, which is thin, flexible as well, uh, and that allows to put a variety of electronic components, uh, microprocessors, uh, wireless communication modules, um, and they are designed to be ultra low power, which means that our engineers um, makes, make them so that they don't use power with, when they don't need to, which is very suitable for um, our energy source. Our energy source is a stack of carbon and cellulose paper layer. Like a normal fuel cell, you will have a bioanode and a biocathode, uh, a separate um, a separator layer, two contacts, and then an encapsulating material to bind the, the hole. So in a simple schematic, at the bioanode, we uh, oxidate the glucose into gluconolactone. This enzymatic reaction will release electron to the electrode. And on the other side at the biocathode, those electrons are pulled by the enzyme to reduce oxygen into water. And so like this, we have uh, electron flow, so a current, and also uh, a cell voltage coming from the two potential of the two uh, half cells. Um, what's very interesting with our device is that because it's paper-based, we can easily adjust the shape and the size of the device. We can also put them in series to increase the, the voltage or increase the size of the electrode to increase the energy. And our vision for the future is to uh, go from the, the electronic platform that you see on the right, that is already very small, um, and that combine sensors like temperature, humidity, pressure, light, shock, uh, and then the wireless communication modules, uh, to an electronic platform with the lowest environmental impact. Uh, and this with our today's partner, ST Microelectronics and Pragmatic. We aim to um, print the antennas and the passive components um, onto an organic substrate with the least amount of uh, microchips. And this combined with our compostable energy source. We can also use other user interaction that are more visual like electrochromatic displays, uh, LEDs, and then uh, that are more auditive or that you can um, you can have an action but by touching. And there are many other opportunities as power requirement decreases. And BFC focus on those low power solutions that you can see here on the right. We are uh, since 2021 in the industrialization phase. We are trying to move from a robotic sheet to sheet assembly to a roll to roll production line, which means a thousand units per um, per day to a million units per day. Uh, and this with our partners Actimium and DCS. Uh, DCS is also operating uh, in the US and worldwide. Our business model is a B2B. For the moment, our BFC that you can see here is comparative to lithium pricing. Um, and by 2024, we aim to reduce the price to alkaline pricing to be very competitive. But we can already enter the market by being competitive uh, with those uh, with those batteries. Um, we also have uh, six patents that are deposited and, and secured, and sixteen uh, that are ongoing. So uh, those six patents uh, are the core uh, patents that were done pre prior to creating the company. 
uh, and they are at pretty much every layer of our device securing our technology. And there are exciting opportunities for replacement of toxic batteries in existing product. Our first proof of concept was actually to replace uh, two coin cells in digital and ovulation pregnancy tests of ClearBlue uh, by one BFC. And we were using the urine of the lateral flow assay uh, to activate the, the BFC and to, and to show the result on the, on the screen. Um, but we can also unlock innovation um, particularly in wearables, medical, IoT, and logistics. And the numbers keep on growing. Um, we have clients in those markets, particularly in packaging and healthcare, that ask more than a, a million, I'm sorry, more than a thousand, no, hundred uh, million units per year. Uh, our competition is the traditional coin and button cell batteries. And if we look at energy harvesting, uh, photovoltaic is our main competition, but can only achieve its high power density in direct sunlight. Uh, then thermal vibration and radio frequency are also erratic. Only BFC can deliver this power on demand with a stable voltage. Uh, so we created the company in May 2020 and raised VC seed funding of 3 million euros within a month. Professor Matantio is in our advisory board. Um, we are now trying to raise series A round uh, to expand internationally. This is our team composed of professors, doctors, engineers. Um, so actually, uh, Professor Jean-Francis Bloch and Professor Martin Thieu are two of our fellows. Um, and we are very proud to have them on our team. Uh, our, our CEO is the brain behind the technology uh, and that come from uh, the University of Bath. Uh, this is our advisory board composed of uh, experts and tech entrepreneurs uh, with proven track records of taking their technology from the lab to IPO. Uh, we also ha still have a CNRS team working, uh, still working on enzymes, biofuel cell and biosensors. We are located in Grenoble. Uh, this is uh, all the awards in media that we have uh, a part of what we have received lately to show that there is attraction to, towards our technology. Um, this is the funds, and I, I will finish by our slogan, together power the future with nature. Sorry, I had to go fast at the, at the end. Okay. So, thank you, Dr. Bakhtiar. Well, thank you for listening. Yeah, to be successful is a very important topic for the whole world now. Mm -hmm. And you use merit as a metaphor to describe the advantages of the biofuel cell. It's really impressive. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So mm -hmm. our next speaker is uh, Professor Jian Hua Zhang from Shanghai University. The first video. Linking the world's four ancient civilizations, as well as the famous Bermuda Triangle, the 30th parallel north has acquired an air of mystery over the years. In China, this parallel goes through the mountainous prefecture of Anxi, Hubei province, where the Tujia people have inhabited for hundreds of years. One of China's larger ethnic minority groups, the Tujia people, make up about 7% of China's ethnic minority population. Today, we have the honor to meet an outstanding representative of the Tujia people, Professor Zhang Jianhua. From the deep mountains of Anxi, to Wuhan by the Yangtze River, then onto Shanghai, Hong Kong, Edinburgh, Scotland, and then back to Shanghai. Professor Zhang broke through many obstacles and endured much hardship to become a respected scientist engaged in the research of macro nanotechnology and high definition display. Now she is a doctoral supervisor and director of the key laboratory of advanced display and system application in Shanghai University. For nearly 20 years, she is both a scientist and an engineer, leading teams combining academic and industry talents to a number of important achievements, including the first multidisciplinary optoelectronic display R&D platform encompassing material chemistry, chip design, information processing, and micro-nano manufacturing. The first 200mm by 200mm AMOLED pilot test line in China the first 7-inch AMOLED color dynamic display, 
the first high resolution display lithography machine, the first oxide flat panel detector, the first batch of silicon based micro displays for ultra high resolution AR VR. As a scientist, she embraces the concept of open cooperation and serves as chairman of the Beijing branch of the Society for Information Display and chairman and co chair of the International Symposium on Advanced Display Materials and Devices. As a teacher, she is a great role model for her students, exhibiting high work moral and encouraging students to pursue science, cultivating the spirit of innovation, and always ready with advice concerning their career development. In her leisure life, Professor Zhang likes hiking and cooking. Ever innovative, she enjoys experimenting in the kitchen as much as she does in the lab and often creates her own recipes. Life is not just about the great ideals, the future and distant, but also about here and now. Professor Zhang's example proves that hardworking scientists who give it out to research at work can also enjoy the tender side of life. of Professor Zhang's talk is display and beyond display. So please share your screen with us, Professor Zhang. Okay, and uh, wait a moment, yeah. yeah. It's okay? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Okay, and uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, first, uh, I want to thank uh, the organizer giving me this chance uh, to join this event. And uh, I'm, uh, it's my great honor to have this chance, as I wanted to say. And uh, today my topic is display and uh, beyond the display. Uh, another, today is our uh, ladies day. So first, uh, let me warmly uh, congratulate our ladies and the girls on the happy Women's Day. And uh, just uh, and uh, from the uh, shorter uh, mm -hmm. movie, you can uh, uh, maybe you understand, you know some of uh, of me. I want to take this brief uh, this chance uh, to introduce myself again. And I spent uh, my PhD and uh, uh, most the Cairo uh, time in Shanghai University and uh, about uh, 25 years. Currently, I'm the chief professor and the director of the key level of advanced display and the system application. And it's also and, uh, uh, judged by uh, our Minister of Education. And uh, with the help of my uh, students, and my part, industry partner and my research staffs. And these years, we are focusing on micro lalo fabrication and also display device materials and the flexible electronics and the variable medical device. And the Shanghai University, and as the name, and is also located in Shanghai. And uh, I think a few of them know my university. I want to take this chance to give a very brief introduction. Shanghai University, we had three campus, and the main campus is located in the, the three campus located in, uh, looks in, looked in different uh, district. One is the Baoshan campus, is our main campus located in uh, Baoshan district. We had, we have another two, uh, campus, one is Jiadin and the Yanchang campus. My research label locked in Yanchang campus is very downtown. So hopefully mm -hmm. or some of you have a chance to visit Shanghai. And if you have time, please visit my research label. It's very close to downtown, very close to the peoples of, very close to downtown. So enjoy the science activities. You also can enjoy Shanghai sightseeing. 
I would like to introduce some uh, very beautiful uh, scenery, uh, scenery cities I have spent. I was born and raised in Hubei, Enshi, a very beautiful mountain town. Mountain town is my hometown, like uh, such as uh, big, uh, big Georges and the, the very dangerous pathway and inside the mountains. After that, I spent my under and master degree in Wuhan city. And you know, in Wuhan, we have very beautiful East Lake, and we also have very uh, beautiful Cherry Blossom University, Wuhan University. And uh, then I went to Shanghai for my PhD degree. After that, uh, I have a chance to do research associate in City University of Hong Kong, and then went to Harvard University in Edinburgh, Scotland. In 2000. Three, I come back to Shanghai and stay in Shanghai. This took quite long. I spent, I grew from lecture to associate professor and then to professor and the chair professor. Now I'm the chair professor of the following subjects. One is mechanical engineering and another is the microelectronics and the new display. So today, and for time elimination, I would like to uh, introduce, give this chance, I, want, I would like to introduce uh, two parts of our research activities. The first is the display innovation, device, material, and equipments. I think every one of you has low display, and the display is everywhere in our life, such as our mobile, mobile phone, our TV, our pad, our PC computer, and the, in the future, the VRAR matter system. In the ancient display is, lo, is just like, and they displayed in stone and the bamboo. Story inspiration and the bamboo sleep is our ancient display. From 1980s, display industry grew very fast. From CRT to TFT LCD to OLED, from 2D to 3D, from hard to flexible, mm -hmm. from passive matrix to active matrix, from 2D to 3D, display changed our life dramatically. How to fabric display? It's very difficult and challenging. Maybe I think when I haven't entered into display technology, I have low knowledge about how it's difficult, how it's difficult. When I entered into this field, wow, it's so difficult because the display device, especially active metric, this device is very complex. How to make a display? I have an example. In a big subtree, display device has millions of them. It's like we should to kick off a soybean in a standard football field. So it's very difficult. Currently, the world and the China display industry grow very fast. I always, I always think we are very lucky that we grow up with the China display. In my university, and the Professor Zhang Zilin and the, uh, a gentleman, he published the 
Chiara managed the first OLED device paper in Ba Guang Xue Bao. And then from 1992 and to 2010, and the display, most of them are PM device. I come back from I come back to Shanghai from Edinburgh from 2003 and to to Lao. I spend most of our research time into this field. In 2010, I led my research team to launch the first seven inch AM OLED display in China mainland. And then in 2017. Our research group launched the, the January 6, the NISA graphic machine for display technology. And then go to 2019, we got through PI materials, flexible materials to flexible device. And in the latest two years, we also developed the high resolution flat panel detector for medical DR. So the following, I will give a brief introduction about them. And I think our research team is very lucky because uh, we got the industry big support from uh, such as companies like BOE, Tianma, CSOT, and the Visinox, and also EDO. And uh, with the support of my university and our industry partner, we set up one 200 and 200. It's just uh, eight inch pilot line that uh, with this pilot line, we can carry on AM OLED, flexible electronics, and the micro OLED and the micro LED design, fabrication, and the many device and the structures fabrication. I and my students, we to organize the two research team. One is focused on basic research. This is the KNAB or advanced display and system application. Another focus on engineering development is TFT RCD K materials and the technology National Engineering Laboratory. In so many display research, the key achievement, the fact the number one key achievements at the beginning is AM OLED for color display. In 2011, our group demonstrated seven inch AM OLED for color for color display in China mainland is the first time. And uh, from device to panel, from single color to from a single color and to four color display. And we spend about five years from basic research mm -hmm. to engineering integration, from IC chip to the TFD device, OLED device and the encapsulation. And the inside, we also do some very interesting basic research. We invented high color purity OLED. And the bound grip is just and it decreased from the 72 nanometer to 5 nanometer, very purity. And we also invented sunlight sunlight like OLED. That's it give us very friendly and healthy light source. The second achievement is for flexible. And as we were low, flexible display is very challenging. And we showed the fabricate millions of device not on the glass, not on the silicon subtree, but on the polymer flex subtree on one side and the PI material 
is a very challenge. And uh, we, our research group, give the new design and the senses. We want to increase, increase the TG temperature and then from level to the industry, we go through the PI slurry and uh, improve the TFT device process based on PI substrate. Finally, we got through black spot display prototype. Now, this technology are transferred and uh, applied in our industry pattern. The third key achievement is about uh, this graph machine about TFT. And uh, as we know, and for semiconductor display device, this graph is, uh, is the very important process. How to achieve in the very large substrate, like three square meter, the big substrate, to realize the very small structure, like 1.5 micrometer is a big challenge for us. From 2009, we cooperated with SMEE, one co Shanghai company, we developed, we cooperated, we integrated process machine and some mechanical engineering, some mechanical engineer, physical engineer, chemistry engineer, and information engineers mm -hmm. worked together. We got through from labor from laboratory to factory, from G1, G.2, G4.5, and the two G6 generation. Now, this technology has been widely used in industry, such as BOE, TFMA, CSOT, and the Wisnox. And the first key achievements in display is flat pallet detector for medical DR. And in the left picture, we can see and the medical diagnostic DR imaging system now is widely used in the testing and in the patient testing and the cool and the cool. And the key components is a flat pallet detector and the net transfer the X-ray to visible light and then you to electro signals and then finally we got the image from TFT device and the two X-ray sensing materials is the key is the two key parameters to high resolution no X-ray dose and uh, very safe. And uh, in the last two years, and uh, this flat panel detector are used in medical DR. So it uh, guaranteed for safe for COVID-19 patients. And uh, the other part, I want to give some introduction about our research activities on beyond the display, that how we design and fabric flexible transdu transducers based on TFT display device. Here are four parts I want to show. Part one is bionic flexible sensor. Part two is multi-parameter sensor. Part three, is a neurophysical testing sensor, and the part four is artificial therapeutic device. And in sensors, especially high density sensors mm -hmm. array, the big challenge is how to overcome signal cross talk and to short circuit complex and 
decrease power. Inside, among so many TFT structures, TFT device and application has good advantages for sensors because TFT display device has quicker response, small pick size, large area array, and very flexible. At the same time, the big subtree for low cost fabrication. So we always thinking how to make good sensors using our traditional TFT device. These two these years, I worked with my postdoc Zhao Tingting Li Jun, and we got uh, some very good result. The first result is about bionic flexible sensors and inspired by natural leaf surface and our and the sugar particles. And we fabricated hybrid porous microstructure for pressure sensor. And then we did very good work. And then we use the pollen grains and we do also do the pressure sensors. We got the ultra wide linear response range. And uh, from the next picture, you can see, and the stable are very good. With this stable performance, we achieved ultra wide sensing range is able to sensor to detect varieties of different pressure ranges, like a very, very low gas flow, acoustic vibration, raised pulse, finger gesture, and also some voice recognition, human pulse, and also finger movement. And the Second research results is a multi parameter sensor. And we used IGZU TFT and the Maxon and the CNT new materials, hybrid materials. We designed and fabricated a multi parameter sensor. And the temperature and the pressure signals are very good. And these two signals without any sensing copy from the left picture, you can see, and this green and is for the pressure. And this, this line is for temperature. And the temperature and the pressure without sensing copy. And the second research result and the latest is the neural physiological testing sensor. And for process, how to construct the pathway between the process and the neural system is a big challenge. Conventionally, and the electrode error and the electrode system is a key technology to resolve. Traditional we used passive electrode error and the spacing is around three to 10 millimeters. We developed one new device, active electrode array, and the dimension of the TFT is just a micrometer and the electrode spacing is less than through three millimeter. So, smaller structure, higher density, and the SNL and its double is quite good. And now this system is used in some process and the neural system testing. And another very interesting new research area is the artificial cell particle transistors. And as we were low, and our human brain has so many advantages, like 
good voter tolerance, low energy consumption, and the learning advantage. So if our computer can, like, can work like our human brain, and we can achieve another functions like edge computing, artificial vision, and artificial intelligence. So, set up a particular transistor is a key route to simulate the memory and the learning function of human brain. There are lots of materials and devices to achieve our aim. One of them is metal oxide cytopartic transistor. It has, good, it has so many advantages, such as room temperature fabrication, low power consumption, but it also meets so many challenges, like low electric conductivity, poor memory and learning ability, and lake stability and fabrication. How to overcome these, these problems? I and my research team and these years were focusing on artificial cytopartic transistors. We invented different structures and cooperation with different materials like ISO, TFT, C3, M4, PVP, RTP with PVP and the sex and the finally we simulate the short time and the long time memory of human brain and the, the latest we also achieved artificial tactile perception and artificial sensory system and also a simple memory and the learning function. So, and if you have interest in about our latest research work, you can find uh, the details about the following publications. And uh, finally, thanks for your attention and uh, happy Women's Day again. And uh, as, and uh, how to say, as a mom, and a lady professor, I wanted to tell you, and all, we can do it. We can do science, we can do technology, we can do engineering, and we also can do everything. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so thank you, Professor John. Very impressive. You really gave a very detailed roadmap of the development of China's display technology. And by the way, the Chinese Journal of Luminescence is published by our institute. The director of the publishing group, Professor Yu Hongzhang, just Yu Hongbai just gave a talk in our first session. So such a coincidence. And. Uh, Last but not least, our final speaker today is Dr. Ferda Cambers from University of Basel. Let's watch the video first. Bass. She was born in Kerklarili, Turkey, and completed all her degrees in her home country. She received her BSc degree in Engineering Physics from Istanbul Technical University in 2011. Later, after a Master of Science degree in Optoelectronics and Photonics Engineering from Koch University in 2013, she received a PhD degree in Physics from the same university in 2018. Her research interests include femtosecond lasers, solid-state laser development in the near and mid-infrared region, and biomedical applications of lasers. 
Now, Freda Jambas is a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Biomedical Engineering, University of Basel in Switzerland. In recent years, she mainly focuses on optics-related technological developments in the field of bone surgery. She is doing active research under a flagship project called Miracle, which is acronym for Minimally Invasive Robot-Assisted Computer-Guided Laser Osteotome, where she develops alternative laser technologies for minimally invasive laser surgery. Recently, she has taken on the role of event officer in the Laser Systems Technical Group of Optica. She likes reading novels, watching movies and TV series. She also enjoys sports, hiking, trying out new things and traveling in her free time. So, very interesting. And uh, the topic of uh, Dr. Canvas' uh, presentation is a laser bone surgery project uh, miracle. So please share your screen with us. Yes, one second. Yeah, you see my screen, right? Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction and the lovely video. As you all heard, I'm Farda Jambas. I'm joining this event from Basel, Switzerland. And I'm, a, I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Basel. Now in this talk, I will describe how we use lasers for osteotomy in the Miracle Project. So before I go into details of the, of the talk, I'd like to introduce myself shortly. Uh, as you have heard, I completed my studies in Turkey at Istanbul Technical University, then Koch University. I received my uh, PhD degree in 2018. And since then, I'm a part of the Department of Biomedical Engineering, uh, where I have also recently became a group leader, actually. So we are located at the border of France here. So as you can imagine, we are working in a very international group. And here's a lovely picture from the city of Basel. If you, uh, maybe this, this picture would help you to come and see the see the city actually it's a really nice city and with the with the river line in the middle so let me start with uh, a description of osteotomy to my talk for the ones who have not heard of it it's a particular name for bone surgery actually so it's simply a surgical intervention to bone what you do is to remove a piece of bone to uh, place an implant, or in another case, realign the bone, actually. So this skull you see here was found in a region called Cappadocia in Turkey, where you saw the balloons in my video, actually. So this is the first known example of a bone surgery from our history, and it shows that we, we do these surgical interventions for, uh, for a long time. And it's known that this patient lived for another 10, 10 days after the, after the surgical intervention. But uh, you can imagine the techniques were not as good as uh, right now, probably. So the intervention was, the, the surgical interventions were done by using these tools from the earlier times to, to today. And are they, are they, they are frightening, right? So they, they look a bit uh, uh, frightening to me at least. So, and these are the tools that we use today to perform a bone surgery actually. Not much changes in, in here. They are shiny though, but not, not a lot changed. But surgeons using uh, conventional bone surgery still saws, drills, hammers, and, and similar tools. So one day, if you need a bone surgery due to some bone cancer or another bone disease, before you know it, you would find yourself in an operation room filled with these equipment. As an alternative to these shiny but frightening tools, he suggests using lasers which are controlled by a computer and a robot as a part of the miracle project, 
which stands for Minimally Invasive Robot-Assisted Computer-Guided Laser Osteotome. We have four main groups in this flagship project. All are responsible for different parts, such as planning, uh, robotic control, and smart implants. What I will introduce you today is a part of the work we have done in the biomedical lasers and optics group. To achieve bone surgery uh, performed by a robot, there needs to be a pre-planning phase uh, based on the CT scans of the patient. Actually, uh, I'm sorry, to achieve bone surgery generally, you need a pre-planning phase where you, where you collect the CT scans of the, of the area of interest and then uh, you discuss before the surgical intervention. Then the patient is brought to the, to the operation room, physical marks are placed, and then the procedure starts. In our foreseen future, it's similar to this. We have a similar planning step, but we plan to use ARs and VR goggles, actually. And after that, we foresee to have this type of settings in the operation room to perform the laser surgery by using the robot. Here you see the robot, or maybe more than one robot, performing the surgery. The surgeon or the operator, which can use a handle to, to operate the uh, robot, if needed, of course, and the patient laying on the uh, laying on the, the the bed. In addition, you see the topics that we focus on in our lab. Of course, I will not focus on all of them today due to limited time. I will just describe some selected studies. So first, let's start with why we want to use lasers because lasers provide high precision in cutting. This leads to avoid damaging vital tissue and due to high precision, less tissue loss and therefore shorter, lead, uh, shorter healing time for the patient. Since it's a contactless intervention, it provides high sterility and less trauma. Again, contactless in, uh, operation will pro provide vibration and pressure-free operation that causes less pain for the patient. But how we choose the laser source? How we can, what we can do to obtain minimally invasive laser surgery. The main absorptive in our body is water. And as our bodies uh, contain roughly 70% of water, particularly for bone, another chromophore needs to be considered, which is called hydroxyapatite. You see it here. Since there is a strong absorption uh, for both water and hydroxyapatite at around three micron, we focus on RBMIAC lasers operating at around the same region. We then need to decide which type of intervention do we want to have. Based on this laser tissue interaction map and the needs of our project, we decided to use high energy, relatively long pulse RBMIAC lasers because we want to obtain deep cuts by the laser. Still, high precision is required. Uh, and, but if we go to the shorter pulse, pulse range, we know that we would generate some plasma on the surface, for instance, or we, would, we may damage the, the surrounding tissue by some cracks, by inducing some cracks. However, one major drawback using these lasers is the irreversible possible side effects, such as carbonization. So to optimize our process in the free space, we did some preliminary experiments to find the best condition for efficient bone ablation. Here you see the experimental setup on the left, which contains a thermal camera to detect the temperature of the surface of ablation. A water jet, you see it here, to reach the deepest point in the cut, and a pressurized air nozzle to clean the cut and also destroy the debris uh, that is generated during ablation. Here, another important point is due to high absorption in water, high absorption of the laser in water. One needs to adjust the amount of water to be enough to hydrate, but it shouldn't be much, to, to, much that can block the laser energy. So they, 
There is a simple feedback mechanism that we use here by using the thermal camera. By measuring the surface temperature, we try to find out uh, at which temperature we should apply water and at which not. So on the, on the right side, you see the ablation rate of one pulse ablation is a function of incident fluence. As expected for one pulse on the surface, it's directly proportional with incident fluence. But as we go deeper, we expect to reach a saturation point. Since we try to optimize the irrigation parameters as well, we investigated different conditions for the cooling and pressurized air, which is used to clear the laser path. The irrigation system needs to be controlled depending on the need of the tissue. As I just mentioned, water only needs to be applied when the tissue is dehydrated. Here, the automated here you see automated, refers to that condition. The thermal camera in this case sends the feedback to the irrigation to deliver some water or to stop. We reach the optimal depth for this laser with the automated water application and air pressure. But there's still some problems for this setup, like thermal cameras imaging resolution. We couldn't get any information from the deepest point in the cut, from, but from the surface. As a result of these experiments, there was no tissue damage even at the deepest point in the cut. However, this system is still open for more, uh, more advancements. And uh, this is in the, in the literature, the deepest that is reported uh, so far, that the cut depth is around two centimeters in this case. Then, since we want to have minimally invasive surgery, we use the fiber delivery system. Looks a bit confusing, but let me, let me guide you. The setup starts from here, from the bottom, at the output of the laser. Then the laser sends into a fiber, which is then delivered to the, to the surface of the sample. We tested several fibers here. And our results showed that gamma oxide fibers can be used for these high energy applications. Note that we use this same simple feedback system here to keep the irreversible effects of the laser under control, uh, as, as I described earlier. As we know, these lasers can increase the temperature of the surrounding tissue, leading to carbonization. To keep the temperature at a reasonable level, we have to apply some water irrigation to the surface in a past manner. Here you see our current design to miniaturize delivery of the, of the laser output. At the, after the fiber, we place these two uh, lenses to refocus the beam onto the, uh, onto the sample surface. And the cut depth was around one centimeter after, the, after using the fibers. This lens system is still slightly bigger than an endoscope or what described as an endoscope by the surgeons. We are therefore continuing this project to optimize this system. So far, we talked about the laser part only. As long as you have enough energy or focusing with your laser, producing, uh, producing high energy to ablate the tissue, you will cut whatever in front, measure, meaning there is no depth control or tissue specificity in laser tissue removal process. Considering mandible, for instance, you know that there is a nerve channel uh, inside the bone. If you start cutting from the top, laser could reach to the nerve channel, which could lead to this type of paralysis on the pa patient's face. This is because the laser system has to be so-called a smart laser system. There's a photo showing some bloody tissue on the, on the next slide. If you have any problems, please don't look at it. To develop a smart laser system, one of course needs a laser which will remove the tissue. This laser should somehow communicate with the tissue during the procedure. The requirement is to have real-time feedback, which will need to be in a closed-loop control setup with the cutting laser. So then laser will know which type of tissue was cut, in which depth it goes, or when to stop. In addition to this, 
We also need to know if the surface is dehydrated or not. So feedback systems can also be empl employed for these uh, dehydration uh, to figure out if there is any dehydration or not. So information of tissue type can easily be provided from the laser tissue interaction itself. To do this, you need to send a short laser pulse to the surface, which then needs to generate some plasma light and uh, consecutive acoustic shock waves. For the, for the feedback systems, in addition to our ablation laser, we use a frequency doubled in the act laser, producing nanosecond pulses with uh, high energies. After this uh, NDAC laser is focused to the surface, as I said, you first generate some plasma. So if you analyze this plasma light, you can get atomic fingerprint of the region of interest by using a spectrometer. This method is in general called laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy, or in short lips. Of course, you would see some particular lines depending on the tissue type, but it is usually not easy to decide by checking the spectrum only. That's why we use some fast machine learning or artificial neural network methods to differentiate the tissue type based on the spectra collected from the surface. Another approach could be analyzing the generated acoustic shock waves to differentiate the tissue type. Here it's the same. The generated shock waves or acoustic waves depend on the type of the tissue. However, it's not easy to differentiate the signals by, by just our eyes. Again, neural networks are used to provide feedback about the tissue type. These two methods are working pretty nicely with low errors in differentiation. However, both of them are slightly invasive methods because of the uh, tissue removal before the analysis is performed. Recently, we developed an alternative technique to reduce invasiveness of the lip system. We adjusted the laser energy at a certain level, which could only generate plasma in bone tissue, but not in the soft tissues. So it's a kind of thresholding method. Since our application is to cut bone part anyway, we don't damage any additional tissue, even uh, by applying this invasive method. With this method, we could provide real-time feedback to the ablation laser in a close loop, uh, with a closed loop control setup. Here you see the photos of different samples where we kept the tissue differentiation system on and off. As you see, when feedback is not provided to the cutting laser, it cuts everything in front in this, uh, along this line. When the tissue differentiation system is on, we could preserve all types of soft tissues. And here you see the OCT images, optical coherence tomography images of the cuts, which clearly show that soft tissue is nicely preserved during this, uh, during this application. And here you see uh, the, these images from different cross sections of this, of this sample surface. For instance, this method can easily be applied for brain surgeries to cut the skull, where soft tissue needs to be completely preserved. In another study, we investigated the capability of lip system, as an induced breakdown system, for the detection of early carbonization. This study can directly be a feedback system to adjust the amount of, of water on the bone sample. In this work, we first apply a different number of albuminic pulses at different loca locations on the bone sample. The output of the albuminic laser was not focused because the idea is to dehydrate or even carbonize or burn the sample without ablating. In these experiments, number of pulses varies from uh, 0 to 25, and as you can see, it starts from the bottom left and increases up to, up to the top. After even applying three, four pulses, the damage is already visible on the surface. We then place this sample in front of the NDAC laser and send the, the laser to the sample surface. The generated plasma light is 
then collected back to this fiber input. He analyzed each grid on this sample by using an, a home-built HL spectrometer. Then based on the collected data, we could differentiate dehydration and carbonization. So information provided by this setup can be used as an alternative to adjust the amount of water on the sample in the future. And these two systems can be combined and applied at the same time so that the, uh, the deepest point of the cut can also provide you some information or we can collect some more information from the deepest point of the cut. As a second feedback system and a depth control system, we also work on the development of optical coronal tomography, which is a non-invasive method. Working principle is similar to ultrasound here. Instead of sound waves, we use laser light together with an interferometry setup. Here you see some videos collected from a commercially available OCT system. In these setups, imaging ranges are quite limited. And that's why we decided to develop our own system, which can go as deep as 3.2 centimeters in air. But note that in our application, we don't need to collect much information from the, from the tissue itself. We, our cuts are, after, after we induce these cuts, we are operating in air. So the imaging ranges I'm talking about are all in air and collected, collected in, in free space. This setup is a fiber-based setup, which is already integratable with the laser ablation. And as you can see in these videos, we can visualize the laser ablation process as we do it. Here at the bottom, you see a 3D construction, reconstruction of the, of the cut. And in the middle, you see the ablation process as the, as the ablation laser is applied. Here you see a small jump, which corresponds to this, this hole in the middle of the bone. So this is similar to seeing the surface of the bone. And when you reach to the desired depth, OCT system can send a signal to laser to stop it. This way, we have a visual and structural information of the tissues while we cut with the laser. And in conclusion, we manage using lasers for efficient and deep ablation. We used laser tissue interaction mechanisms to differentiate tissue types and figure out the carbonization amount to the tissue. Finally, we also developed our own optical coherence thermography system to visualize the population during laser surgery. And you can see more details in this, in this link here. As a final remark, I would like to thank all the group members of the Miracle Project and Werner Siemens Foundation for their support. This project will be finalized in this June and continue with the Miracle 2 funding for further miniaturization starting from June 2022. Thank you for your attention and happy Women's Day. And thank you, Dr. Cambers. From the talk, you can see the amazing application of laser in bone surgery. It's really a miracle. And thanks thank you. To all Okay, thanks to all speakers today for their enlightening talks. Now let's enter the panel discussion. Please welcome all our honorable guest speakers to be on the stage. This afternoon, actually, you know, we, we have uh, listened to six uh, enlightening talks, and I hope that this panel discussion uh, can really give us uh, uh, more help yeah, for the young researchers. Okay, so as you are all working in the field of science and the research, so I wonder what do you think are the essential qualities of an excellent research scientist? So Achana, would you like to start with? Yes, uh, thank you. I think uh, the ability to learn of all throughout uh, what you're doing and 
in fact, the boundaries that we put in front of us, they are just imaginary boundaries. That is the ability to learn and push these imaginary boundaries. And also I think we should all be able to have a medium and long-term strategy. I mean, uh, at the beginning, we are always focusing on publishing papers, high impact factor papers, things like that. But this is what I call medium strategy. We need long-term strategies as well, because we want to see not only knowledge advancement, but also translation of what we do. Because imagine you spend 20, 30 years of your life working on something, you want to see something come out of it. Therefore, having a strategy is very important and also we should always keep that curious mind whatever age we are whether we are young mid-career or, or whatever we need to keep curious mind we have to be flexible and we have to be able to adapt ourselves uh, we should not think that if we are in a field uh, we should not know what is going on in another field and it's always very interesting to listen to people uh, that are in fields that are related to you. Not, not always your specialty, but you can learn new things that you can apply to your own uh, field. I think it's very important to see what is happening around you. These are qualities, I think, that makes a good researcher. Oh, yes, I really agree with you. And how about uh, Marie? Uh, sorry, I didn't understand uh, the first question that you asked. Okay, so what do you think are the essential qualities of an excellent research scientist? Um, so I think um, resilience, determination, uh, creativity, and also allow yourself to, to make mistakes. Uh -huh. You know, most of the, I mean, I wouldn't say all of the research, but most of best research also happen by accident. Um, and it's also the, the fun in, in science. So, yeah, I will keep it short. Yes, yes. allow ourselves uh, to make mistakes, yes. And yes. Uh, how about that further? <laughs> yes, yeah, for me, I think to be a good scientist or to be a scientist in general, honest, honesty is the first value that I could think of. And personal ethics and moral values are as well important. And these should be followed by curiosity, hard work, and enthusiasm, of course. Yeah. And I believe without being driven uh, or motivated by technological advance advancements, uh, one shouldn't be a scientist. I think it's not a, it's not a job to make money. <laughs> so we can say that to the young researchers, maybe. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah, enthusiasm, passion are uh, all very yeah. important yeah, to be a researcher, yes. And I know that uh, you are all very successful in your work, but I guess you also have the experience of encountering the obstacles or difficulties. So would you like to share some moments with us? Okay, so Achena? <laughs> yes, I think uh, we should maybe say challenges uh, because uh, we have challenges. And I think finding, uh, because I really like what was said before, you know, finding your inner pathway is very important and it's a big challenge because at the beginning, you're not too sure what you want to do. It's, uh, you do will you stay back uh, in your country, go somewhere else, build a life somewhere else? I mean, to know what you really want to do, it's a, it's a big challenge. Once you're set on that, then um, you can do just anything if you work hard. I think this is a big challenge. I mean, personally, I think setting your mind on what you really want to do is a big challenge. Yeah, yes. And uh, any other would like to share your opinion? Okay, so maybe we can cast a, a Come to next question. So anyway, from your talk, I can see that you all enjoy your work. So what do you think is the biggest gain in your work? Uh, Professor Wu, would you like to start? <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, um, actually, I think I have to keep my mind young and uh, to always think about something difficult and something I don't know and try to understand the world. 
And this is a true meaning. Uh, we do the search. And uh, the other thing is, uh, uh, if, uh, if I can keep young, I can talk to my son and uh, the next generation, uh, including the young students and uh, uh, even the, a granddaughter. <laughs> and then I, I can uh, have no gap with them. So this is what I, I can think. Oh, yes. Yeah, that is a really very good point. Yeah. So, you know, uh, some of the audience say that they cannot believe that you are grandmother. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. So. I'm so proud of it. <laughs> 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 I miss my granddaughter so much. Uh, this is. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, because in different cities, yeah, during the pandemic times, so it's difficult to travel. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so how about uh, our other guest who would like to answer this question? I think uh, I can fit in here. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, uh, first of all, yeah, I mean, you can't believe that you're a grandmother. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, yeah, uh, looks like <laughs> and uh, the, uh, you know, uh, one of the things I've gained is uh, w what I really see looking back, uh, I've been in this uh, business of teaching and research for the last 17 years or so. And uh, I think the, uh, there are several paper journal publications, uh, this, this award and uh, you get this grant and you, know, you, you get every day, it's like, it's, it's some success or some failure. Uh, but but what I actually uh, take back or uh, the biggest gain is uh, what I think for me is uh, or something that rather than biggest gain, I'll say the biggest happiness I get is when I teach. Right? Uh, you know, uh, that kind of kick you get after every lecture, uh, I don't get after every uh, visit to the research lab. I mean, of course, I get that kick once in a while when we get some good results. Uh, but at the same time, you get uh, very disappointed when, you know, you had thought something would work and it's not working and the students come back and say, oh, no, this did not work because of this. And so, you know, that's all kind of, uh, so it's important to go, not get into the negativity and uh, being a member of, a, 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 you know, faculty of a teaching institute, uh, there's always this balancing I always get when you go teach every class at every end of every lecture just just you get that kick and you forget about everything else right? so i think the biggest gain has been the ability to teach students and uh, also uh, the fact that you share everything with your students your success your failure your triumphs and tribulations or whatever it is right and these students go to different parts of the world and they become the future uh, masters of research uh, they direct research further that I think is the biggest gain for me. Thanks. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so we need to try to be positive and optimistic, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. And uh, so can you tell us which achievement you are most proud of uh, so far? So, Professor Zhang? Okay, uh, yeah, and the sense and the technology, I think is very interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, how to say, in my research activities, I, I wanted to say that's very important. Uh, most achievement is that we can transfer the basic uh, research mm -hmm. to engineering application. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe like uh, the first and the uh, I am all at the display that we go through from device, uh, from IC design and to uh, device fabrication and the panel integration. I think that's very, and uh, very, uh, we are very uh, proud of it. And another night uh, for lady and I led a research group, most of them are gentlemen and uh, the, um, students and uh, we, uh, how do you say, we developed uh, the uh, uh, laboratory uh, equipment to industry production. 
uh, I think, uh, very um, the next, our most achievements. Okay. Yeah, that is really yeah impressive because you put the research into reality that everybody really can use it in the industry. Yeah. Yeah. That you can transfer it into like our variable device and our mobile phone and our some flexible and the medical device mm. that use the some technology of my research team. It's very and interesting. Yeah. Yeah, can yeah. benefit uh, yeah the common people yeah okay yeah and uh, how about Achena? Uh, I would say I think I can safely say that the achievement I'm most proud of is the team the team that has been built here mm -hmm. and what we are leaving behind for for them because you have to continue the team uh, because there is no way I want the lab to uh, to disappear. I think I'm proud of them because they have been able to adapt to the things we wanted to do. They have been able to learn new things. And uh, we are looking forward to having our spin-off company. And I would be very proud if it is run by the team because they have worked so hard to make this uh, lab emerge in this part of the world. I think I'm, I'm extremely proud of them. And I will be proud, you know, to leave one day and to leave such a team behind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, teamwork. Yeah. And uh, how about uh, yeah, Deepa? Would you like to share your opinion? Uh, um, yeah, sure. Uh, see, uh, I mean, I said this in my talk. Uh, I'm I was trained as a physicist. Okay, all through uh, my uh, studies was in physics. And I started uh, working with lasers when I wanted to study nonlinear optics. And nonlinear optics was something that was very interesting. And in order to um, see the nonlinear optics, I'm, I'm an experimentalist. So in order to see nonlinear optics, uh, we needed high power laser sources. And my research guide said, look, there's no fund for high power buying those. If you want, you can build. And that's when I started building my first laser. Okay. And uh, then the laser that I built, uh, of course, we used it to study nonlinear optics. Then I moved on when I came to this job. Uh, there again, this team was uh, doing something with lasers and I picked up on two micron lasers. So I was very interested to see this laser surgery that uh, um, Beda, uh, did I pronounce the name correctly? Yeah. Yes. Very interested to see that because um, we started building this two micron lasers and uh, the biggest gain or the biggest uh, achievement, I would think, was uh, something uh, that uh, uh, Professor Yahua had mentioned that uh, the first time when the lasers I built went into a box and it was transferred to a company or somebody said that this can be used uh, for applications. I really don't think they are using it in a medical equipment at that, uh, right now, but still the fact that uh, what I actually thought as a physics problem and became an engineering problem. And then we found nice engineering solutions. The next product was something about using lasers. We used lasers as a sampling clock and uh, we made the front end for a photonic analog to digital converter, right? I mean, those are the things I thought, I never ever imagined that it could actually become a product and it is going to be useful. <laughs> That, that's, that's something that I thought is the biggest gain. Now I'm consciously trying to see how to make my lasers suit the applications that are required for either medical or in photonic ADC or uh, things like that. Yeah, so it means that you are not only doing the research in the laboratory, now you can really to put it into products. Yeah. And uh, how about uh, Mahi? So what's your idea? So um, first of all, I want to say that you're all inspiring to me. Uh, hearing you talk is, is very, very inspiring. Um, I, I think also that the seeing the team grow is one of the, the best achievement that I think um, is for me as well. Seeing the, the, the people that I manage evolve uh, being happy in what they do, taking you know credit, taking uh, responsibility and 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 pride, uh, that's very nice to see. 
Um, also he hearing them that uh, they think of me as a role model. I think that's one of the achievements. Um, obviously being a part of such an amazing startup uh, with a, you know, a goal of um, reducing environmental impact. Um, and then personally, um, it was graduating from a PhD thesis uh, from a university in the US um, and also playing in uh, NCAA. That was um, personally, but as a researcher and as a, and as a manager, um, I would say the seeing the team grow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. To just uh, to study, so all your lifelong time, yeah. <laughs> and to learn from others and also others also learn from you as you are a role model so this is really a, yeah a good achievement and uh, uh, my next question is that uh, uh, can you briefly talk about the difference between being a researcher manager research manager and uh, a scientist for, for me yeah um, yeah um, so uh, it's just the, the goals that you want to achieve and um, I think when you are in research there's maybe more freedom and openness um, in, in what you can create what you, you can do and we have that in, in our startup as well um, and as a manager toward the product there's other goals other deadlines you know, just other tasks to do. Um, and I think what's, um, I, I don't think it's it's that different actually, um, but people always say I'm very adaptable. And actually one of the, the, the best thing about being a manager is for me, and particularly as a um, old <laughs> basketball player uh, is to, take the best out of people um, you know and, and use it for for the test that we want to do so everyone has a role to play it might be the biggest role it might be the smallest role um, but for for the task that you are implementing I think finding what's best in people for that that task mm -hmm. is um, one of the strong points but um, I don't know it's, it's difficult to say that there is a, a different. It's just different, you know, different goals, but I don't think it's so different to have a, a team and to and to work together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, how about Professor Wu? <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe uh, I maybe the situation in different countries are very different, but mm -hmm. I think uh, in um, considering uh, I'm growing up in China and. Uh, to do the search in Changchun Institute for such a long time. And uh, I think uh, it's uh, if, if I can get funding without uh, uh, so hard uh, uh, seeking and work, I'd be very, uh, very happy. And uh, someone gave me money to let me do the search. But uh, unfortunately, I never had this chance. And uh, do, uh, since uh, 1999, I have to manage the this money for funding so hard for myself. And in this institute, you have to pay everything uh, for all the group. So I, I, I think it's a, a lot of a difference between the research manager and the scientist. The true scientist, you have to solve the pure uh, scientific uh, uh, issue or problems. And uh, you must involve us uh, very much in the research, but the management, you spend your lots of time and you cannot uh, involve uh, all your um, all your time and uh, and you, 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 it stopped your thinking and you, are, you, are, you have to continue thinking something uh, for such a long time, even when you sleep and uh, you might get uh, some ideas to mm -hmm. solve this problem, but uh, management may break your thinking always. So I think it's a different kind of thinking and uh, uh, according to, the, to, to your age. Uh, if you are young, I hope, yeah, I think it's better you have enough time to do pure research. And uh, when you are getting old, no, you, it's not possible. So you have to manage yourself. 
that's a different. Uh, is this is my opinion? <laughs> it's a very special situation oh, in in this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not only this too, in uh, Chinese uh, Canvas Sciences, uh, this uh, uh, special place. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, it's true I, that I have uh, less time in the lab. So I agree, this is a, I, I miss it um, a little bit. So that's very different in, the, in that sense. Um, a lot, by the way, not a bit. <laughs> um, but yeah, I totally agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> so you agree with Professor Wu, right? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I would even go to the extent that, uh, you know, when you are, uh, at least in, uh, I, I can tell you the Indian perspective, uh, that uh, when you're a professor in IIT, uh, you're running a one-man company, right? You are uh, teaching, you are uh, expected to do certain administration, uh, academic administration, um, you are uh, bringing, writing your own proposals. Uh, you are marketing your own uh, uh, ideas. Uh, you are your own HR, bringing your students. Each student comes with a separate baggage of problems. So you are your own HR. And uh, I think the list just goes on. And uh, I, I, I really wish I can go back as a student where I just... Yes, yes. I, me too. I, I, just, I get one week of uninterrupted thinking, right? Uh, <laughs> about one week, I don't even get one hour of un uninterrupted thinking during the day, right? So I really wish I can go back to be a researcher and not a manager. <laughs> I mean, there are people who do that very efficiently. I see that some of the facets of, you know, some days I'm an excellent manager. I'm very proud of myself, but sometimes I just get disillusioned and say that, okay, can I just stop everything and can I just pause everything around me and sit down and think about something. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that, that's our perspective. Even though there's a very excellent, you know, admin support system, there's a legal cell, there's a project cell and so on, but still you need to keep talking to them. You need to keep getting work out of them. It becomes, uh, yeah, sometimes your hands are full. Yeah. yeah. Yes, agree. <laughs> really agree. I think we all agree. <laughs> <laughs> you all agree. <laughs> Yeah. That, and sometimes I do feel that I didn't want to bring in the women thing here, but I sometimes I start questioning, is it because, you know, we women find it more difficult or is it that it's, it's true for everyone? You know, I keep asking that to myself. No, I think we just question more than men. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, I have actually um, um, a research project for um, a year now. And um, yeah, I'm still trying to go to the lab to, to finish. So sometimes I go at the weekend or stuff like this. So I totally you understand. You can support that. Yeah, in France, uh, we are not allowed to work at the weekend, but I still do it. <laughs> yeah, that is what I think, that as you are in France, you can work during the Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I think uh, the holidays, is, it's, a, it's very important because during holidays, if you don't take these holidays, uh, yeah. do lots of things, but you can, open, uh, you can empty your mind and the thinking more. So if you mm -hmm. don't have holidays, we are just like... A, um uh, growing uh, like 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 working 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 i don't know what you what you are doing so holidays are very important for right. scientists <laughs> yes yes yeah so that you can <laughs> you, you will get refreshed <laughs> yes. otherwise you are too exhausted with the work yes. right <laughs> okay I totally agree. Mm. yeah <laughs> so we're heated uh, discussion and I think uh, as just now, uh, okay, many of you mentioned about the team, teamwork. So I just wonder as a team leader, so how do you coordinate the relationship between you and the, the team members? So what is the biggest challenge you have faced when you manage a team? So, Achana? Maybe, yeah, maybe I take this one. You know, the, I think the biggest challenge is if you're in your team, you have people at different stages of their career. And you have to manage that. I think it's a big challenge. That is, if you have PhDs, postdoc, research fellows, research assistants, 
and uh, you have to be able to uh, to know what they want as well. I mean, you have your own ideas. You want them to work on this project and that project. But when they reach the stage when they have done one postdoc, a second postdoc, they may be wanting other things. And you have to be able to channel that if you want to keep your expertise in your group. You have to be able to channel that, and you have to be you have to be a good observer. This is what I do. I, mean, I don't know if my students are listening to me uh, today, but this is what I do. You know, I may be sitting in my office, but I observe uh, how they work, uh, who can work with whom, who can work together on projects with industry, because some of them, you know, they uh, have better aptitude for, the, for an academic career. Some of them have very good aptitude to work with industry. You have to be a good observer and see uh, where to place the team members for their own professional development as well. I think this is a big challenge. And sometimes you fail because then you can just see people coming and see you. Uh, I'm leaving tomorrow and, and you, you, had a, you had other plans. And uh, it's a big challenge, uh, I think, uh, because uh, recently I'm seeing this more and more because uh, the postdocs, they want something else. That's why getting the spin-off company at this point in time will be very good for the group because I would be able to channel those that have other ambitions to the spin-off. And <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So how about the other's opinion? So uh, if, if I may, um, basically I would, I always take it as a, a basketball team. Um, and you know, when you play, you you obviously have people that are better as, as at shooting three points. Others are better at being in the keys. Um, so I just take it as like organizing uh, the play, like I would be on, on the court. So it's funny, but um yeah I just take it like this and one day uh, you know that person might be the best at, at doing that task but one day she or he might not uh, and you also need to 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 adapt on that yes yeah I, I think just take it um, just take it as a sports team <laughs> really yeah yeah so no, no, no one is perfect They're just uh, trying to find their strong point so that exactly uh, yeah mm. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, ac um, like to accept their uh, weak points as well as embrace their their, their strongest um, uh, skills. Yes. Yes. And uh, how about the? So how about Professor Zhang? As you mentioned, that actually you have a very big group, right? And also your group, there are a lot of uh, male yeah, uh, professors uh, or students. Yeah. So have a, a female leader. So do you have any difficulties to manage the team or? Me? Yeah, 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 Professor, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, how to say, and uh, just like uh, Attila, and uh, I think uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's a big challenge in that uh, uh, we should know uh, what they want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's the, uh, is the big uh, is the key issues that to uh, manage a, a bigger research mm -hmm. team yeah. and uh, sometimes we should uh, to think of uh, the young kids and uh, their academic and uh, all their career roadmap from lecture to associate professor to professor or from uh, uh, how to find a good job, and uh, if uh, your students and uh, your assistant can find a good position, mm -hmm. and uh, you also can attract uh, so many young people and uh, uh, fresh, uh, fresh students to join your research team. Mm -hmm. And uh, and for me, uh, another challenge is how to balance uh, your uh, Academic and engineering, and you know, and uh, in university, and uh, we should uh, give uh, output like uh, papers and projects yes. and awards. But for industry, and uh, their wish are quite different. Yes. So how to balance and uh, your uh, academic uh, team with the engineering team, and uh, is a big challenge. I always think uh, we are very. I, I'm very lucky 
like uh, my students and my university uh, college, colleges give me big support uh, that, that they, we discussed and we cooperate to push the basic research. And uh, we also have very good industry partner that we can uh, Oh, we also work day and day, day and night and uh, weekend and uh, working time and to uh, to to push our industrialization. Yeah. Yeah. So like uh, left and uh, right side, right hand and left hand, act academic and engineer, you should keep very well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so let's come to our next question. So why did you choose to work in science and the research field? Okay, I, I want to, to say, and uh, there are so many reasons uh, I choose science and uh, uh, technology. Uh, I think the very important is free. Yeah, we can, I can arrange my time uh, mm -hmm. very freely. Oh. And uh, the second, I think, and uh, is uh, helpful mm -hmm. that uh, I can, sometimes I, when I find I can help the young kids and the young students, uh, I'm very happy and uh, to, 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 to know it. And uh, I think very important that uh, Sense and the technology that can make our life much better. And uh, for example, as my research field, and uh, from the a bigger mobile phone, a very heavy that we, our lady and ladies, we should uh, use a, a bag, different the bag to keep on, uh, keep inside. <laughs> but currently, yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, so. Uh, lots of choice and hard, flexible, and uh, smarter glass. Yeah. Yes, very interesting. That it can make uh, our life better and better. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Also, uh, the some if you uh, imagine the, the how to say the the mechanical information and uh, imagine the with. Uh, Biosense, you also can develop uh, some very interesting uh, medical tools or medical device that uh, can very be helpful mm -hmm. for our human life. So it's very proud of this. Yeah. Yes. Uh, how about uh, other guests? So, so I, oh, sorry. Please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so I would say um, uh, basically th throughout my, um, you know, student um, career, let's say, st student career, um, I always was taking this decision based on, okay, what, what field do I like the most compared to this one? And I would just go on like this and I and I ended up really liking chemistry um, then formulation then I was like okay ind industrial chemistry is very nice but I also want to see the research I feel like I have more uh, opportunity to be versatile to be to adapt to to any situation to any new problem to learn every day as well mm -hmm. um yeah, I guess that's why I, I love research um, as of today. Also because we get to teach, we get, we get to, to, to transfer the knowledge. Um, but yeah, but at the beginning, that was just, uh, I would say, uh, um, a flow of choices and, and, and decision. Um, but yeah, I was always attracted to, to towards science. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, I have a similar question that is, if you do not choose to work in science, so what profession would you like to choose? Uh, for myself. 
Um, I don't know. Basketball player. <laughs> um, actually, um, yeah, I was always torn, you know, at the interface between between the studies, the science, and and always basketball. But um, I, I've seen a, a future way more in into science on on the long term. I can't remember who was saying this. I think this was Deepa. Uh, but um, to have a um, you know a plan for the the like medium term and then long term um and then on a long time i didn't see it uh, for basketball i was good but i was not the best huh? so um i was very realistic and um yeah i just love it i just love to go into the lab to create something to find problems to to solve them is just um uh, it's just very nice mm -hmm. um but Yeah, I was always like half, you know, I, ha I had practice every day. Uh, sometimes I had twice a day. Wow. So it was always juggling in between, but I always loved both. So, mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you do some jogging in your laboratory. <laughs> yeah, I used to run a lot actually. Um, oh, when I was at the University of Oregon, um, And I would miss practice in the morning because I was doing my master's uh, degree in chemistry. Uh -huh. um, I had to do the practice in another way, right? Uh, so I would run one hour and a half, sometimes two hours. Um, I would also go and, and lift. But I was very grateful to be a part of the University of Oregon and, and you know, to play in that, uh, in that team. It was just amazing. Wow. <laughs> Impressive. And how about the further? So... Yeah, uh, I, I have to admit that my, my decisions were similar to Marie, actually. So it's a flow of decisions and I try to follow what I was passionate about. And the other thing that I was passionate was medicine. And now I'm somewhere in between, actually. I'm still kind of following that. Yeah. So I think I would have been a surgeon if I wasn't doing science. Then I would just go to the operation room and... Uh, do some surgeries uh, but on the other hand I'm sure I wouldn't be happy to see sad patients every day with lack of hope and I don't know that that would probably kill me <laughs> from inside I, I believe so I'm really happy that I followed the the second dream that I had which was which was to work in science actually <laughs> yeah Yeah, as in your talk, you talk about uh, your bone surgery. It seems that uh, you are very close to your uh, adult yes. <laughs> choice. <laughs> yeah, that's why I said I'm I'm simply following both my patients yes. still in, in my work, actually. Yeah, you're very lucky. Yeah. yeah. So how about the others? <laughs> I would say that I wouldn't know what to do if I were not doing science, because before coming to science, I had tried everything else. I could. <laughs> so in high school, I've tried learning music. I've tried doing dance. I've tried every other thing that, and, and I found that I'm, I'm hope, really hopeless in all that. And, <laughs> uh, and science probably is the only thing, maths and physics was the only thing that came naturally to me. So I really don't know what I would do if not for science. Yeah, I think because you have talent in science, <laughs> so compare it to your talent to science. I didn't like, want to be a stereotype. My elder sister was uh, doing maths. And so I didn't want myself to be called as somebody following my sister's footsteps. So I really wanted to be consciously, I wanted to try out everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, tried sincerely hard trying violin, uh, trying to do dance. I mean, it was all very difficult for me. <laughs> and it was a, Whereas, whereas uh, the moment it came to physics, things, especially optics, made a lot of sense because you could see everything in front of you, right? I mean, there's no magic there. You could actually see it. And that's when I realized, oh, yeah, this is probably what I want to do. Right? Yes. So, yeah. And, and uh, uh, my, my father was a banker and his wish was, you know, uh, you have to be in a bank and you should actually do, uh, you know, doing a banking profession is probably the best Uh, profession uh, and coming from India and uh, from the part of India, we are a very conservative family. 
says that's a nine to five job and you know you're all well settled uh, with that and uh, it, to his uh, great disappointment i did not clear even a single bank test <laughs> right. yeah so you are really very successful actually <laughs> Uh, how about Professor Zhao? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. And the, would you yeah. repeat it? Yeah, yeah. I said that as a, yeah. So why do you choose? A, a, okay, to work in sciences. So if not to to choose a working in science, what profession would you like to choose? Oh, technology. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Maybe. And the chief to cook it. Oh, cook good. good food for for family. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. During the video, I yeah, I say that you are very good at cooking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think for me and the, oh, just uh, has uh never to think of other career, another uh, another career. Yeah, uh -huh. other career. Just the science technology and the, I, I, I enjoy innovation. So I enjoy different research topic mm. and I enjoy to uh, teach students and help young kids. So uh, I think it's uh, most of all, uh, maybe after retirement uh -huh. and uh, to try another new career, uh, yeah? Oh, maybe retired. to, yeah, maybe to invest a, a company and <laughs> and as a, and a, we know and we can manage a bigger research team. Mm. I think we also can manage a, a good mm. company. Yeah, mm, mm. but uh, not be not uh, should uh, after retirement. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So thank you. So ah. Uh, what, in your opinion, are the advantages and disadvantages for a woman to do science work? Okay, let me take that. Yeah. Uh, I think we have a lot of advantages. <laughs> I think uh, we are wired in such a way that multitasking comes naturally to us. I strongly believe that. And uh, the women can definitely multitask. And uh, not just that, uh, take... Uh, any task to completion uh, very successfully, very sincerely. Um, and I think that's a big advantage. And uh, probably uh, we are not uh, very ruthless. Sometimes we ought to be, but that, that helps as well. Uh, but having said that, um, sometimes because we are not ruthless or we are not assertive or we are not... Uh, <clears throat> not, they're not uh, aggressive, I would say. Uh, not, I'm not talking about all women, about I, I'm keeping myself as a reference point. Sometimes I wish I could be a little more aggressive, stick to my point. Uh, I, I always think that I think for others, right? I would say, oh, what is that other person maybe thinking if I say this? And I think one, I should stop doing that. And uh, th that's one disadvantage, I would think, that because... Uh, Maybe we are, uh, at least I was uh, brought up that way that you have to be compassionate, you have to think about what others are thinking and so on. Uh, so beyond a point that becomes a disadvantage for you. For, up to a point it becomes advantage because you, you are sensitive, you are, uh, when you, especially when you're working with a team, uh, it becomes advan advantageous, but sometimes uh, the same thing would not be really uh, good for you and you end up at the end of the day uh, you end up uh, saying yes to so many things and struggling with the uh, workload that you have yeah that's what i have to say i i totally agree to that and i would like to continue from here also uh, but uh, even even though there are many advantages such that you are being unheard maybe sometimes and you are not aggressive enough I just don't want to focus on these disadvantages, but I think Deepa would uh, relate to what I will now say. So for instance, in optics, there are not that many uh, women 
and when you go to conferences, you are very different from the crowd. And because of that, many people can remember you actually, which is really a nice thing. I'm usually good with faces. I don't remember the names most of the time, but I, I see that whichever conference I attend, if I go there a second time, then many people would remember me, come and talk to me. Having a coffee talk would be easier because, and male, male subjects, I would say here, <laughs> They like to have a woman around and having a coffee talk with them and so on. So I like that distinction, actually, even though it could be a disadvantage. I, I think we can use it as an advantage for ourselves. Yeah, but as a, if, I, if I need to consider something as a disadvantage, I think assigning uh, organizational jobs to women can be the worst disadvantage that I can think of. Because as if you are not inventive enough as a, as a female, these, uh, these topics can be assigned to male students or male researchers. But you, you are the one who is organizing meetings and <laughs> because we usually don't say no to these things, we kind of fill our time with these additional tasks, I think. But... Uh, throughout my studies and my time as a researcher, I believe I started learning this and I'm, I'm happy with that. And everyone should do this to themselves. Saying no is something that we can do and we should do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I thought it was great. Yeah. That, that's, I completely agree with this point about conferences. I mean, you don't get to see... You don't get to see somebody wearing a sari in a conference. So how about that? Yeah. <laughs> in fact, uh, a sari. I represent this uh, IEEE Women in Photonics. And I was trying uh, to find a speaker a month and uh, in the area of photonics. And I really find a woman speaker a month. Uh, and, and I find that the names that keep circling back to the same few names. And we really have... Either we don't have women or we, we really don't project women uh, achievers. And, and I think that's very important to, uh, somebody uh, said that in the, one of the talks or, uh, you know, if you ask, uh, this is a study, result of a study, if you ask somebody to close your eyes and imagine a scientist, imagine an engineer, you be either, a, either an Einstein kind of figure or a man with a white coat that will appear uh, in the minds, whereas you know, I don't know if uh, anybody would imagine a woman, or rather, the, I wouldn't say anybody, maybe the, the fraction of people who would imagine a woman is going to be very, very small. And then I realized that, you know, it's the same same popular, uh, I, I mean, of course, they've all achieved great, but I'm just saying that it's only very few, a handful that we have. So I think, take, following up what you said, we should go to more conferences, we should make ourselves seen, and then, and then make up space for ourselves, I think. Yes, yes, agree, yeah. Okay. And I guess this is the, the goal of today as well, is to, to share our experience, to share what happened to, to us in, in our career. Yeah. So thank you for doing this. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for joining us. <laughs> so actually, this is also our purpose, to have this event. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. So yeah and because we have... Yeah. Yeah, because we have amazing stories you yes. know, to tell. Yes. Um, and, and at the end of the day, we, we are thinking every day, oh, am I, am I a good role model? Am I um, worthy to be standing there and I actually to, you know, to talk about this subject? Because there's so many people working on that subject or, you know, et cetera. But yeah, we, we should stop thinking that because we are in that area. We are thriving um like I, I totally agree with uh Ferda and Deepa totally and um you know I think it needs to come from a, a young age and also your your background what what happened in your life and and all of this but yeah saying no and standing up for yourself is uh is very important I used to and I'm gonna go back to basketball again but when I was young at uh, like 10 
10, 11, I would go uh, and play on the, on the playground. And there would be only men's, only. And at first they were like, oh, well, you're a woman. You don't know how to play, right? <laughs> and I was like, I'm practicing every single day. What do you mean I don't, I don't know how to play? I'm playing at the high, highest level in my, in my city, in my region. So I was like, okay, let's learn how, how do they proceed, etc. cetera. And um, uh, at some point, there was nobody else to play but me. So they, they let me play during the game because they wanted to play and do some sport. And then I scored, I scored, and I scored, and I would, like, you know, win, win the games. And then um, as time go, like, went on, they would just respect more and more. And I think... Yes, unfortunately, we have to go through that step still as of today. But I think things are changing. Um, I think they can see now that a lot of, of women are very successful and are, and are thriving and are working hard. And um, it's actually nice to see, to see young women and, and young girls being more and more confident in, in what they do. So, Yes. Yeah. Yes. So as you mentioned that uh, yeah, to be a role model for others. So I just wonder, so which female scientist is your role model? <laughs> so to me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, uh, to me, it's uh, Rana, Dr. Rana El Kalyubi. Mm -hmm. uh, so she's a pioneer in um, emotion AI. Mm -hmm. um, and why? It's because during my thesis, you know, at some point I was at the lowest point of my life <laughs> you know we all go through this when we write um, and uh, I just started to I, I wanted to to learn from her I was you know I was like okay mm -hmm. how is she so successful how is she so confident when she talks every time she goes she did TED talks and this and that mm -hmm. and uh, when I learned her story I was like actually my story is, is pretty close um, actually I can do this um, and so I, I, she inspired me in the sense that uh, she was very honest in her story and what she was going through. Um, it was okay to make mistakes. It was okay to not be the best. And at that moment, and, and this is why I will remember it all my life, it, it just made me, you know, like so motivated to, to finish uh, the, the thesis and the work. And it was particularly during COVID, so... Thank you. <laughs> you know, it's it's not the um, it was not the, the best time for none of us. Um, so yes, she she just inspired me. I admire her confidence, and uh, mm -hmm. even if we are in totally different fields, I oh, yeah. yeah I appreciate it to to read her book. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so, how about her, Professor John? So, which female scientist do you admire most? Okay, and uh, uh, Professor Xie Xie De. Oh, yeah. Do you know? Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, and uh, a very uh, famous uh, 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 semiconductor physicist in China. Yes. And uh, she was not only a scientist, but also a very good uh, university president yes. and uh, the former president of that university. And she was also uh, very international and uh, studied and uh, worked in USA and then come back to uh, China and uh, study and, uh, and worked in Fudan University. And uh, besides, uh, she was also a very good wife and mom and uh, especially a very good uh, supervisor, professor. For students, mm -hmm. so um, uh, in her time and at night time, and our China and the semiconductor technology is at the very beginning, and uh, Professor Xie Xide come back mm -hmm. to organize our university uh, semiconductor lectureship and uh, uh, help lots of university to open the public uh, uh, lecture classes uh, for our China and also uh, she organized uh, so many events for famous, for famous uh, 
for ladies and for girls uh, to encourage uh, girls and ladies and to study science and the technology. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I know her very well. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, I would like to call um, my last question that is, uh, how do you balance your career and the family? I know as a women that you, uh, some, uh, most of us still need to care about the family. So how can you balance it? So okay, let me take that. Yeah. Uh, I'll give you my experience in that. Um, there have been easy phases. There have been difficult phases. It's not the same uh, every time. Uh, in case of my family, of course, I have uh, to tell you who my family is. My family consists of my husband and my son. Uh, my son is in his uh, third year undergraduate uh, uh, right now. Um, he has gone to hostel. He has gone to a different university. Uh, I think uh, the way it worked is uh, because they were on my side. Both of them were on my side. In fact, I did my PhD after my son was born. So from the time he's seeing me, he's seeing me with books, which, uh, you know, he's seeing me studying something, writing something or working with a computer. Uh, I share every bit of work with them. Uh, I share all my failures, all my successes with them. It's like an evening story. Oh, today what happened? Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, they are more anxious about my tasks to be completed than I am myself. Uh, so I think the way it worked, uh, I think it worked reasonably well, is to share what you do in your life with the family. Mm. Uh, I still remember my son, uh, when he was in school, he would come back and ask me, uh, I'm studying and I see that you're reading some, you know, uh, fiction book. Don't you have to study? Don't you have to teach? Why don't you study? <laughs> so uh, that way it worked uh, quite well. Even now we talk on phone and he would say, okay, so what's, what's the new course you're teaching or what's the latest challenge, right? So, and, and we, uh, we treat each other at the same level and, uh, that way it, it works touch wood i hope it works in the future as well yeah i can't agree more with you yeah yeah i also do the same to my daughter actually <laughs> yeah and uh how about others so um, i have a boyfriend and a cat so <laughs> <laughs> i mean <laughs> I'm not yet with the family, but my cat is very demanding. <laughs> That's a child. Yeah, it's a, it's a main coon. He's very big. Right now he's sleeping, so it's not joining. But um, but yeah, otherwise I, I don't have uh, family time except, you know, with my boyfriend, obviously we, we work both a lot. So we just try to uh, find time for ourselves, uh, which is very important because otherwise we just we are just on the computers we just forget about each other and uh i think we really make a point to sometimes uh, think think about others but yeah I'm, I'm very happy in my life um you know so through, through the ups and downs and uh, he was there in the hardest moment so i love him a lot. Uh, I, I also want to add something that i think uh, one or one more important thing to uh, implement is that we don't have to do everything. Uh, mm. We really don't have to do everything, right? So, uh, I mean, prioritize and, you know, do only thing that, only those things which are really you have to do, otherwise, no. So I, I outsource my cooking, I outsource my, in fact, uh, when I was in my earlier place in Bombay, we used to, there was a chauffeur. I mean, India, I mean, we are fortunate that we can afford those things. So, mm -hmm. uh, not when we were in the US, we were in the US for some time, that was not something affordable at that time, but we had a chauffeur, there's a cook, there's a maid, there are two maids actually today uh, to clean things, to do it. So I think one has to accept that one cannot do everything and uh, outsource. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, how about Professor Wu? How do you see the relationship between work and life? <laughs> Someone told me scientists should uh, live in the laboratory. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
uh, um, in, I, I don't know because I have no uh, opinion about that. Uh, when you focus on something, you might need a lot of time. And uh, it depends. I still think it depends on your age. If you have uh, kids, you, uh, you, you, you need to take time with them and discussing with them. And to cook or not is not so important, but you must focus, uh, pay attention to growing up of their um, uh, their life and uh, their uh, opinion of of the uh, a lot of things. So, but but I didn't do so much. So I I, I don't think I'm a good <laughs> good at uh, like like in family. Uh, I don't like cook. Uh, I like to, uh, I like to, uh, to wash dishes and uh, someone call me a uh, dish machine. <laughs> I, I don't like cook. It takes such a long time and you have to prepare lots of, but I cook to my dog and I have to uh, take him outside every day, two times. And uh, when I go on business somewhere, I'm thinking a lot about uh, him. <laughs> 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 Yes, I, I think uh, different people and different age, you, um, the, the, the life for you are different. You, you, you totally need uh, different things. Yeah, mm -hmm. yes, yeah. So you see Marie bring her cat here. <laughs> it, was, it was biting my legs. Eh? <laughs> Mary <laughs> was bored. <laughs> So, so Professor, so next time bring your dog with you. Yes, yes, yes. I I would like, but uh, he cannot go in this office. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for sharing the cat with us. Actually, time really runs very fast. So before my last question, I still want to know that. So why did you choose to participate in Erosion Science event? <laughs> <laughs> to me or to Sarah? everybody maybe <laughs> would like to answer this <laughs> yeah yes it's actually uh, professor martin Thieu, um that uh, suggested that to me so we obviously i, I know him for, for uh since 2020 now or even 2019 and um I, I just love to 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 work with him. To he's very creative, uh, mm -hmm. and is um, is a, a tech entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And um, basically, when I was in the U.S. for the CS uh, in Las Vegas, we we had a chat, and uh, I was discussing my thesis with him, and uh, some of the struggle that I had during my thesis. Um, and then he was like. Um, you know, you, your story is very interesting. And actually I have an event uh, coming up soon. I think you should participate. And I was like, oh, okay, that, that would be nice. But I didn't know about the event before. Mm -hmm. And I and I quite enjoy it. I quite like it. It's a little bit like a, like a podcast. So I really like it. <laughs> so that's how I learned about, mm -hmm. about the Thank event. You. And I said, yes, directly, obviously. <laughs> So actually, yeah, this is the fifth time for this event. And the second time to be online because of the pandemic. But uh, mm. actually from last year on, so it is online. So because we cooperated with IKS Talks, this platform is really, really very good to just uh, to make the online uh, uh, event possible. Yeah. And then we, uh, I talked with Alice Zhang, the founder of IKS Talks, that we will have this event every year on the Women's Day. So if you have your friends and you, you uh, we welcome you to, yeah, to recommend yeah, your friend to join this event. I think it's really meaningful, right? <laughs> yes, Yeah. definitely. Mm -hmm. I, will, I will always suggest it. Great. And how about uh, Professor Zhang? Okay, and uh, I, uh, so I wanted to say, and uh, it's uh, very, uh, happy and uh, to make new friends <laughs> in this VR and uh, okay stage. And uh, I, uh, the first aim I wanted to tell the young ladies and the girls and uh, science is very fun and the science can make you your life uh, very happy. Yeah. And uh, our our ladies, uh, our women can do science and technology and uh, innovation very well. 
mm. and so powerful. Um, and also want to uh, uh, another reason is my good friend Alex Zhang, yeah. and uh, invite me to <laughs> to yeah. join this. And so I'm very happy to uh, to know you all of you, and uh, your story are very uh, dramatically. So I I will enjoy and uh, appreciate it. Okay, hope you visit Shanghai and. Uh, uh, very welcome, welcome to visit uh, my Shanghai University. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you for your support. So, how about uh, Deepa? Uh, I mean, uh, I, I was always interested in China in general. Uh, I, I still know very little about that country and I visited uh, uh, actually once to Wuhan and once to Shanghai. And just before the pandemic, uh, there was a visit planned, but it did not happen. Uh, there's, um, uh, you know, always interested to know, uh, because uh, just like in the video, you said there's a lot of common things between India and China, but I still know so less about it. Um, and so I jumped at the opportunity when I, when I, heard, when I saw this invitation from uh, your side. And I'm really glad that I participated in this. I got to know a lot of you, not just only from China, but uh, now Mary and Freda and uh, everyone. It's, it, it's real pleasure to be a part of this event. And my first reaction, actually, when I uh, saw this uh, invitation, like what Mary said was, oh, did I do something enough to be a representative like this? Or, uh, you know, am I uh, eligible to be this? Uh, then I said, okay, it's China, and that somebody's invited me from China, let me do it. <laughs> and, um, right? So uh, I, I really look forward to more uh, interactions and uh, visits to China, and uh, also to uh, make more and uh, new friends. So welcome you all to China. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, let's come to our last uh, question. So would you like to give uh, some suggestions to our young uh, science uh, students uh, or female uh, science workers? Yes, yeah. uh, hard work always pays off. Yeah. Um, obviously it might take some time, but uh, if, you, if you put your mind to it and you, and you stick to it, um, you, you set yourself goals, um, you know, everything is possible, so. Mm. Yeah, everything is possible. Believe in yourself. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I would like to continue from here, maybe, because my points are similar too. So I suggest them to be stubborn enough and hard work, yeah. of course. And they may need to fight for themselves and they should if it's necessary. <laughs> I I think. Uh, if they are passionate about science, then they should go for it. Yeah. And this might be a male dominant world. Yes, we accept that. But we can we can be present, and I think we should be present also because we have different perspectives, different things to bring in this in this world, and they should embrace it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. I totally agree. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm sorry. I would, I really like to share experiences and ideas, and I really want to thank you for this event because it's really nice to be able to do this and to maybe touch someone's lives like this. Thank you. Yeah. To be seen, to be heard. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, lots of time in, at least in my experience, young adults have uh, come back and including my son, come back and ask me, uh, how do I know what do I like? Because I, I have no opinion about anything else, about anything. It's not that I hate uh, anything, but I, I know what I don't like, but I don't know what I like. So the, I, I, I think to the young uh, adults, the, uh, the suggestion is, um, ask yourself the question, what is it that you like to read about or what is it that you like to do 
without somebody forcing you to do so and that's what you like mm. right so yeah. uh, any uh, young adult who wants to do science i would uh, actually suggest my way try out everything else i mean i've tried as i said drama music dance you know name it i've tried it but um, something that stays with you something that you eventually uh, do without anybody uh, you yourself forcing yourself to do uh, make sure that science is uh, that before you take up science because once you take up science uh, unless you enjoy it it is it's going to be really hard right so uh, the rest of the points are similar to what others said uh, you need to have goals but keep your goals very simple and pragmatic and once you fix your goals don't give up on them uh, no matter what the obstacles are because uh, i strongly believe that every problem has a solution it's just a question of finding them yes <laughs> uh, how about uh, professor wu um i think uh, uh, you don't think about you are women or you are fi- uh, men uh, when you grow, uh, when you growing up uh, i think i very much uh, thanks to my mother and uh, she never treated me like uh, i'm a girl i should do girls things mm-hmm. because i found i i'm not good at uh, saying i'm not good at uh, painting and i'm not uh, as good as uh, my brother as this uh, many things uh, associated with this but i can be uh, more logic thinking and i can do uh, lots of things so my mother encouraged me always and uh, i never think i am a woman and i should uh, do something else except a scientist and i i think i can do anything i want mm-hmm. and uh, just uh, uh, don't give you the uh, limitation and uh, try to think you are when you are doing research work nobody think you are women uh, you are a woman so you should be uh, take care <laughs> be take care or something else so you you are, you are uh, very much uh, equal to others mm-hmm. and um, uh, i think it's uh, you think like this it's it's okay so mm-hmm. for all, all the girls uh, mm-hmm. if you want to do just uh, do something they like Yeah, thank you. And the Professor Zhang? Okay, and uh, I wanted to say, and uh, for uh, ladies and also young girls, and uh, uh, my uh, suggestion is very simple, and uh, enjoy, and uh, keep on. <laughs> thank you. So happy times always runs very quickly. Mm-hmm. So yes, yeah, thanks to all the guests for sharing your studies, work, and life with us. So I'm sure that your answers should be of great help and encouragement to our audience today. So in today's world, women have long become a key driving force of the economic development and the technological progress. So we really play a unique role in all walks of life. Of lives. So the guests we invited today cover all age groups and fields, but they have the same goal, which is to help to promote scientific research. So in them, we see confidence, tenacity, and fortitude. Outside work, they also enjoy life to the full with their family and friends and various later time hobbies. So they are all great role models for young researchers and students. And I hope the young people who watched our event today can gain more confidence and inspirations from today's event and know that they alone can decide what they are capable of in their own future. And we understand that sometimes women science workers are under more pressure than their male counterparts. But we hope that all women can briefly pursue their dreams, never forget their original aspirations, persevere and meet all life's challenges with confidence and self-assurance. So, Finally, so thanks to all the guests today, and I sincerely wish you all happy Women's Day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you. Nice to see you.